<laughs> I think you. Okay. Hopefully, can you hear us? Can you hear us fine? Yes. Sorry, I haven't zoomed for a while. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, I'd like to call this uh, Select Finance Committee meeting to order uh, February 8th, 2022. Uh, so sad. <laughs> <laughs> at uh, 9.01. Thank you, man. Okay, no problem. No problem at all. <laughs> Happens to be old time. <laughs> Anyhow, um, we respectfully acknowledge that the land which we are gathered is the unceded ter traditional territory of the Shwepnik. And um, yeah, I'd like everybody to uh, address to the chair uh, before you speak and uh, respect your fellow councillors and our staff. And we'll get through this meeting in a timely fashion. Got any more cells? Okay, uh, approval of the agenda. Uh, any late items for the agenda? Hearing none. Okay, recommend that the just select uh, finance committee meeting agenda for February 8th, uh, 2023 be approved as circulated. May I have a mover? Oh, Harry Anderson. <laughs> Seconder. Um, <House> of <laughs> okay, all in favor? Okay, uh, adoption of the minutes. Recommended that the minutes of the Select Finance Committee held on January 25th, 2023 be adopted. And I have a mover. Councilor Beach. Seconder. Councilor Rich. Okay. All, uh, all those in favor? Carried. Okay, on to new business. Uh, we're going to carry on here with the Transportation Capital Plan. Bianca, I guess you're going to carry it away. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, I think first, um, I just want to do an introduction for our finance team. We have Natalia Crooks that just started last week. Um, Welcome, Natalia. Yeah, so Natalia is our new accountant. So um, previously we had Justin, now we have Natalia. No, and Wendy. So she's and, and Wendy with yeah, she's a hybrid of Justin and Wendy. Yeah. Yes. Great. Perfect. So today we have um, some representatives from Landmark. That'll so I've outlined points in green. Um Finlayson waterfront upgrade, L Street boat launch, and Kerr Road Culvert. Um, that landmark. And answer some questions on between Landmark and Daryl. Um, so the first one, Finlayson waterfront upgrades. Um, these are the upgrades to our boat launch area down Finlayson. Um, and this is currently in operating and getting funded through reserve, and we've applied for a grant. So Daryl will touch on that. Um, because L Street uh, boat launch, we've had this one on the capital budget for a while. Um, we'll get an update on that from Daryl. And then Kerr Road, Road Culvert, um, Daryl will touch on, and that's just a culvert down Kerr Road, pretty self explanatory. So I will pass it on to Daryl. Okay, so a little bit of a balance getting ready for today. Uh, I know this isn't a capital project update. It's finance meetings. We're looking to just plug some money into the right places. I don't want to dive in too deep on you know some of this stuff, but again, some of these things are big financial impacts. So we, we kind of paired some things together at the beginning here that Landmark's working with us on. Uh, Finson Boat Launch is a perfect example. The last update I gave was uh, the end of last year. I, I guess it was summertime. We were talking about getting costing and then getting a grant application in. And I believe that was FCM we applied. No, it was UB uh, Strategic Priorities Fund. That was my second guess. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> we knew that. We grants <laughs> what we've applied for, and we're waiting. 3.52. 3.5. Yes, sorry. Right. 
No, I'm glad you're here. Uh, so we're waiting on that one, and I'm not sure what the timeline is, but I think in the next few weeks, maybe a couple months, we should we should hear. I would say probably a couple months, and this is a big granting pool where they would cover 100% of the costs. So we try to incorporate everything we need in that grant. Yeah. Right. So we had some money last year to get you know some permitting going and get some design stuff done, and we've done that. We've got a little bit of a carryover that we're we're moving into this year. I think is is where it aligns. Um, and basically, this is what we're what we're aiming for. So I've done this capital update before in terms of what we're trying to do there. Just really high level. It'll be phased over two phases. We've got red rentals here we've got the new bridge up here and we're looking at getting this lookout and this section of the boat launch done first it's a bit of a dance with uh ministry of transportation with the bridge once the pillars are gone we come into this last phase so uh we've been in talks with them in principle they they like it they support it with the letter of support uh, the grant application like it is in and we're, and we're waiting for some if this funded, that would pay for all of it. So that's kind of the plan going forward. That we're just in the holding pattern. So we're talking about a little bit of carryover money for next year. And then you'll see it in the five-year plan to be done, I believe, in 2024 and 2025. Right? Yes, 2024, 2025 would be when the works get started. Okay, great. Daryl, is uh, have you dealt with hydro at all? Are they moving that one? That is part of the plan, and the utility component of the bridge is one of the first things they're going to be looking at. Okay, so, so power and water lines and stuff like that. Okay. Thank you. Good. Um, you're the chair, uh, Daryl. Just a quick question. It's not even financially related. I just was looking where it says future dock. There are there any boat slips? For public use, um, is there any space in that for public sure. use? Yeah. So tie up points like we have existing now, we've yeah, not like slips where we would be long term. More tie up spots than we have now. Uh, yeah, yeah. So there will be floating dock, floating racks between uh, lanes uh, one and two and three and four, so that when you do launch your boat, that you can actually tie it up to it. It'll be just uh, short term, basically filled with your vehicle out of there. Yeah. But that's it for slips and tie ups, basically. Okay. Yeah. There isn't a, I don't think there's a lot of space there. But there is an existing um, dock that's over by CPRL. Mm -hmm. Right. If I could have a comment just to clarify, we're here as spots and construction services. Which landmark is a part of the spots for stations, and that's why we have the capital background, we have the construction background, but we are spots and construction services here to help the region. All right, that's great, and I'll get you to do introductions so everybody in the room knows or and, and online. Full name, yeah, I'm, I'm Mark Wallace, I am the part of the construction team at Landmark Solutions. have any questions before we move on? Nothing. Those guys are okay. Roger. I'm late. Okay. Bianca, want to carry on? Yep. So next is the health free boat launch. Touch on this. Okay, so just refresh my memory, Bianca. We've got that. Right now, we do not have a budget. Unfunded at this point. Yeah. 
So we've we've kicked this one around uh, in conversation about you know do we fund it? If we do, what are we trying to achieve? It's it, Capella is a really tricky boat launch. It's uh, you know in my opinion is probably best described as just a good little local launch to, to make anything out of Capel. It's going to be super expensive and super challenging. So at this point, I, I'm not, I'm not sure we should be throwing money at Capel. We're, we're going to have some, some roadblocks that I, I don't foresee you know, resolving in terms of parking, the turnaround, the, the footprint doesn't really lend itself well. We did explore the opportunity to try to dredge through there last year, and I know there was some fault made, and that's kind of a non-starter. So, I think the way we want to do you know, consulting we with a very similar launch is the same component, and we have a tiny dredge. I'm in place to get a maintenance energy. I'm still working with the consultant. In the morning, they see the process that they use to get that type of equipment. But then you're in the neighborhood of this little niche, fifty thousand dollars on a YouTube page. The volume versus what we look at the infrastructure required to make it into a true boat launch. It was well known that the numbers were going to do with this big city infrastructure, which the property lines is a relationship to use. I, I wouldn't say that the dredging is off the table. It's it's time to get the to get the proper process to look at great application of the great great So thank you. So maybe we keep exploring that avenue, and you know maybe in a year from now or or last when we sit down at the next finance meeting, we have a plan to do a limited amount of dredging and at least try to. Enhance that launch. I'm not sure what the solution is. Okay, thanks, Daryl. Welcome. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I think with um, Broom Bridge going in um, and Finlayson being incapacitated for a while, I don't understand why we're not focusing on this a bit more, actually, but because we're going to be under pressure for three years for a, a local town boat launch. Um, so I, I see the challenges in, in the actual ramp or boat ramp itself, but looking at the property lines, why couldn't we fill in the ditches and at least address parking? Because, I mean, I live a half a block up there on Capel, three houses up from Riverside. And, I mean, I get people parked in front of my place all the time, all along Capel. I, it wouldn't take much to um, fill in the ditch line and... Uh, and make parking available right to the property lines on, on both the south and the north sides um, without impacting any future design of the actual boat launch. Thank you, Malcolm. Uh, uh, I guess through the chair, my, my only comment off the top of my head with that is those, those ditches in that area are, are critical. Hmm. Uh, you know, we, we all see standing water in them when the, when the lake comes up and the water's got to go somewhere. So, yeah, know. when I when I say fill in, I don't mean like fill in. I mean yes, you still have to allow for drainage, of course, uh, culverts, um, catch basins, whatever. You know, I, I didn't mean just fill in. Yeah, it is critical. The water tip would goes up to uh, um, Larry's house in the corner, even Brian's house next on Capel. There, it it just barely reaches uh, mine sometimes. But no, you have to leave the drainage in place. But you can fill in to right away and still address the drainage. I think yeah. one of the issues we identified it wasn't necessarily the parking, it was the turnaround for the vehicles with the boats. And you'd be asking them to do a turnaround in an intersection back up the city block. Kind of have some traffic violations if you really do that because especially for parking, it encourages people to go there. Now you have nowhere to actually turn your boat trailer around the back end. Good point there, good point there, Mark. I yeah I don't know what the answer is but I agree with Malcolm that I think it's short-sighted in view of what's coming up to not have 
another way of launching boats that isn't going to be in a major construction site for. I agree with Malcolm um, as well as boat launch is key. It's key right now. I don't know why we're stressing about how we're going to turn a boat around. We turn houseboats around in there right now. We pull houseboats in and out of there. Parking down Riverside, there is storage units all the way down Riverside, Lakeside, Shocker. People have access to parking in those locations. We don't need to inundate the roads with uh, people double parked. We can put little chits on the windows and say, hey, go over to Lakeside Storage because that's what they do for a living. But as far as adding some length to this launch and just maintaining it, I, I think we're making this way too complicated. Like I said, right now we turn trucks, trailers, launch houseboats in that space. So why would that change? We do it now. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor Anderson. Yeah, I tend to agree as well. Um, we're making this too complicated. It would be nice to have a bulb at the end and turn around, be able to turn around and utilize the whole space. Um, parking itself, I probably wouldn't recommend parking down there. Like Pauline says, there's lots of private parking in town. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have any public parking there. But I, I do think fixing up the boat ranch adding more or adding more pads to it is uh it would you know we get a few quite a few years out of it and uh it just needs to be addressed because i mean it's not only we're going to you know utilize or lose uh or our main our main boat launch this one's still used quite a bit mm -hmm. and it's just a, it's a it's 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 a, uh, it's a usable better part of the season so if we can address that it would be it would be good Daryl, if we could actually come up with a figure out a way uh, figure out a way where we could add more pads and, and get the permit process going. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah. Construction window is in two months, February, March, 2020. So we're going to be able to service for a long time. In those water, two weeks. Yeah. That'll be your construction time. That's it. That's yeah. as possible. It's just we. I mean, we're, maybe we're getting a little bit uh, the wrong story. But when they start construction down there, it's going to be fairly busy. When they're down there working at the, at the bridge area, and it'll be congested and everything. So it'll, we feel that it'll actually spread. People will be going down to wet up and going down to uh, Capel to find a find a place to uh, launch the boats. But maybe maybe we're wrong. Um, at the end of the day, though, it's still a busy boat launch, even when Finlayson is backed up to, you know, uh, what the woof. Um, <laughs> this is still used, and it's still used by houseboat companies here who valet um, ski boats, and not just houseboat companies, but marinas that valet ski boats and, yeah, so, and store boats. So it's still, it's still a big part of our community, and no, we shouldn't be giving it up. Um, I'm not saying we make it you know, the super launch, but make sure that it's still usable. Thank you. To the chair. I'm sorry, but I just can't see that when they're building this bridge, that that is going to be a place where they don't want to be launching. I just don't see it. And I, I don't know how long it's going to take them to do that, but I'm sure it's going to be more than two months. Just saying from experience, I know you are, but I think it's the whole thing. We have to look at the whole process that's going to be happening there. So that's my feeling. Okay. So, so. Oh yeah, no, it's it's not that. I just think we have to be realistic about the length of time. Yeah. Through the chair, we uh We've added a couple more pads in, in low water this year. So it does extend quite far out there. I mean, it, that's the launch I use. It's a, and I've, I've never not used Capel because it wasn't you know, in, in shape to use. So it, it functions well. It's just, you know, to take it to another level is going to be really expensive. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure if we we need to do that or if we do what that would entail. So, you know. We're budget time now, so 
Could yeah? Could we could you know? Could we ask you, uh, Daryl, to take another look at it uh, and come up with a? I, I do. We do get a lot of uh, complaints from Papas and Three Boys and Lakeside that in the fall and we can't. You know, you, you're, we need more pads in the fall. So if we could just look at doing that, and I, you know, maybe at the same time you have to look at the drainage, the drainage, and the ditches, and and that, and maybe if we could, uh, you know, just come up with something, you know, fairly reasonable that we don't have to. Spend our, uh, you know, for sure, and too much on it. And then we want to move. Kelly, sorry. Um, could I suggest that we just put a placeholder of fifty thousand dollars or something for the for some work there, and we have and we'll fund it from our rec reserves for the Finless and Boat launch. What what that is to be determined, but at least we have something in there. Does that work? Does that seem like a reasonable number for? Yeah. yeah. You know, Keep in mind. Later, as we, we go through this list, we're going to be talking about a water line that comes down Capel, and that's our first phase of three to get the water flow increased on Riverside. And with that, in, in including paving and an option to widen the road, which would allow for some more parking. So we could address the parking a little bit. So, and just one other one, Kelly might be able to answer this one, and Bianca did. Uh, is there some DCC money from the Three Boys project there? Uh, for any of the improvements? No. No, there, no. <laughs> we looked into that last year. Okay, I, I remember we talked. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, okay. You want to? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, this has been a really challenging project for, for a long time. Uh, I'm really pleased now with these guys. Uh, made it out to a meeting last week and you know when we had it engineered and submitted and reviewed and approved finally you can kind of kick through the yeah so I, I showed this at an update last year it was just there's really so much more to this with geotacking with just so many things um, we've got everything in place now for a work plan uh, the Slats and Corp has, has met on site last week. We kind of looked at how this would all happen. Knowing that we want to keep that road open, we've got people past that corner on the traffic moving. I really like the plan. They're just pulling it together, formalizing it now. Um, yeah, we're, we're going to take a run at getting that in this year. So last year, we, 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 we intended to do it. Price of steel went up. Everything went up. I just said, let's buy the culvert. Let's get that part done. And we'll, we'll refocus and get it in. So August will be the window when it's full water. You got to avoid the bird window. You got to avoid all kinds of things. So that's the plan. And uh, I guess you guys are working on a, a work plan. Okay, actually, that's it. Oh, cover. Okay. So, yeah, I'll take a look at that later. And, uh, that was the original plan there where we actually had. Coffer dam built and then a diversion coming to the other side. And I think it was a 900 millimeter culvert that had to bypass the creek. And it was it was a lot of work. And these guys looked at it and said, you know, why don't we just do a couple of sheet piles? It'll be quicker, it'll be easier, it'll be cheaper, we can pump. The environmental uh, check marks were all met, it stays within the what we've submitted. So I love their plan. And, they will money doing that. So. Right. Well, we like it when you save us money. That's awesome. Thank you very much. Because that's like a million dollar culvert in Sycamus, isn't it? Aren't we pretty close to that? Just by, <laughs> no, I'm just messing with you. It's a pricey culvert, though. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. A couple hundred for a culvert. Great. Well, oh, good. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Is there any technical questions on curve? I mean, I want to tie you guys up all day. Um, I think we've got a pretty good plan going forward. We're going to take some trees down outside the bird window before this yeah. gets going, and then you guys to step in and save the day. Yeah, uh, for dive action, the design that we do that is going on the low side of that. We did meet on site last week, we're going to get some trees down so that we don't have that uh, migratory bird nest we went over. We also have to finish with the July until July. But yeah, looking at two weeks, all the duration. 
if uh, they will actually be originally this week, five weeks. And over the counter for this would reduce it down to two weeks. We would have a temporary uh, single link register to put the traffic to go back and forth. So there would be a minimal tax. And I think that the standing standing deal is they do it in under 10 days and fly around the burgers. So <laughs> sorry, what was this the chair? What was the schedule? What, what when's it scheduled? I missed that. Okay, thank you. Sounds like a lot of windows you got to like. A yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Frog windows. <laughs> <laughs> Hurdles. Like this. Oh, wow. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, go ahead. I, I love the term fish window. That is, that's a new one. Um, I just want to ask a question about, and maybe, maybe Bianca's going to address it next. We skipped over the pump track. We'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. Okay. Just have them here. I just noticed it was looking for directions. So, okay. I so okay. just, just a question. Do we need, I, it says TBD. Yeah. Are we just, is that a we're dollar use, amount? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Since we're here, yeah. finance, do you need a dollar amount in there? Uh, we'll, we'll. Yeah, in a bit. Okay. Yeah, All right. Yeah. Nothing. That's that's really good. Do you we need them, uh, Mark and uh, Lee, for anything else? No, I just heard they're not free, so you guys can go. <laughs> Charge. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Dara. Okay. Here we got one more slide pertaining <laughs> to her. This came from the engineer, and that's that's their number there, all in. So, so we spent the money last year. We bought the culvert. We did some permitting. We did some some preliminary lay. So, if that number, we'll, we'll we'll need less than that number for this year. But I'm thinking it's probably around three fifty. Soft. We put 350 in as a placeholder, of course, like where they're still working with landmark way to bring that number down. Um, so, you know, I'm wanting to leave because we want to talk about it. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is like high estimate. Yeah. What our thoughts are. So mm -hmm. right now it's in there. Uh, 350. 350. It's, it's crazy. The, the monitoring, they were required to have somebody on site 24 7 through that whole period. Wow. Um, like it's it's insane. It is insane. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So we're coming to okay. So we'll come back at it and then uh, let's meet it again. Yeah, if, if it comes, if it well, changes from three, if it changes from three fifty, we'll bring it back and let let you know. Hopefully, hopefully we're telling you a lesser number. Yeah, okay. it's submitted last night. Yeah, so I haven't. Seen okay. It and and before we we're going through today but we re-summarize and we will do it at a committee of the whole afterwards yeah uh uh in march all the capital plans so everybody will be able to look at everything again so and we'll finalize any numbers that we're not quite sure of yeah. <laughs> okay, great thank you okay. so that's right along um so we'll work through parks now we're done with the green pieces um pathways and trails we so we're dealing with the active transportation plan right now so we put fifty thousand in there just as a placeholder until we have some priorities set if there's any priorities or anything that council sees now we can talk about them but right now we do have a fifty thousand dollar placeholder we're putting there in capital um for, for the next five years. For the next five years. So if we look at the five-year capital plan, it's 50 all across the board. So 50 this year, 50 for the next few. Um, if anyone wants to. Okay, thank you, Bill. Okay. Um, I know Malcolm has brought it up and we talked about the uh, pathway from 
from Highway, uh, Highway 97 over to Canby mm -hmm. Softball mm -hmm. Road, mm -hmm. then also the one that goes the other way, if we could go all the way to the houseboat and, and tie those two together. And, uh, you know, as a capital project, um, uh, there we have already talked about Malcolm has brought it up a number of times. Malcolm, yeah, you want to uh, <clears throat> go ahead? Yeah, no, I agree with uh, Councillor Bushel, uh, the deputy mayor, 100%. Um, I think that's the no brainer. I don't think we need an active transportation plan to figure out we need to get the pedestrians from the Trans Canada Highway to Sigma South Squaw Bridge. And, and, and then, like uh, Councillor Bushel said, when you're doing it, you might as well connect it from there to uh, Silver Sands. Okay. Thank you, Malcolm. I, I think the problem that one would be from uh, Highway 97 to Canopy South Squaw for sure. Mm -hmm. And then, even if we start to maintain the other one or uh, try to address that other one. But the big, the big one is just to get the people across the highway and over to the other side of the community um, so they can walk safely, you know, down towards Best Western and, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Council Beach? Um, to the chair. I just, now that I'm kind of living out the other side, just below Bayview, I think that that piece of highway is really dangerous for pedestrians walking on i'd like to that's another area that i think it would be crucial to to produce a, a pathway that's off the highway that people could go up and down it's horrible there like i i don't walk it but i drive it and i see people and and uh it, it just isn't there's no room for them and the traffic is fairly heavy so I don't know how everyone else feels, but. Go ahead, stop. So just question Bayview to where? Uh, would be like below small. Bayview into oh, along the lake. Yeah, connecting the, it's, the it, or to that yeah. pathway that starts at Capel, right? Like we have that taken care of, but we need something else on the, okay. along there. It's just really dangerous for people. Yeah, it's been addressed in our, in our uh, active, Transportation plan and all, um, but also I think I I had it on my wish list there last year and it's it's on my wish list again that I gave Bianca. Okay. Is that that one along? Is that strip? Yeah, well, I had a couple of trails on there. Um, Daryl, you were going to say something? Yeah, I'm not wanting to speak out of turn here, but and maybe Scott can pipe in. Um, my understanding with the active transportation plan is that there was an overview of everything. And then some staff input, and I think Urban has called that list to like some uh, some key projects. And I think we're at a point now, and Scott, maybe you can chime in. I think we're at a point now where the priorities actually get set by council. We we bring, we're we're bringing that forward at some point. Yeah. How far away are we from that? Um, the end of March for sure. Tom. Okay. So, and then, so yeah, you know, to put some money aside, and then council can choose okay. at that point. Yeah. So we could probably sit around and we could all come up with a path that makes a lot. Of yeah, sense. yeah, for each. So, yeah, it's going to be tricky, but I think yeah. they're they're identified and they're coming forward, and then we come to okay. Thank you, Daryl. Then I, I guess this just kind of raises a question for me a little bit more, just financial process. If we allocate 50,000 for pathways and trails, maybe there's an active transportation trail that we've identified. It gets prioritized, council likes it. We go do it. Maybe if we're not at that point, can we utilize this money to widen a road and create a, a pathway, like a, a walking shoulder? Is that is there flexibility to do that too? Well, this is, yeah, this is coming right out of the Recreation reserve usually like widening a road would come out of our road reserve. I mean, we do have flexibility there, but you kind of start. You know, we can do transfer between reserves if we need to. We can look at that. Don't worry about how it's being paid. Yeah. We will fund it if, if if we want. If we can fund it, but <clears throat> we'll figure out the dollars and cents later. Thank you, Bianca. Really? Yeah, I was just going to say that I think we we looked at this at planning and development, and I thought they were going to come back to us with a list. And we there's a few things that I think you're identifying, Scott, that are easy to do that would have high impact. So 
I guess that's still the plan, correct? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, Councilor Bailey. Uh, um, what other thing, Daryl? Do we, you know, most of these trails that we're talking about are uh, on the highway, and they're in with, within the highway right away. Do we have we kind of started a process with highways that we're extending? We want to. I know we talked about highways about the bridge, and yeah, formally not. I mean, there's there's been discussions. There, okay. there. <laughs> Not sure. I'm not sure the best way to move forward on some of that stuff, but uh, I think you know my my way of thinking is let's identify what we want to do, and then and then we'll push like hell to get it done. So, yeah. All right. Well, that's good. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So the next one is the pump crack. So this one um, we have not spent any funds. As of yet, last year, um, Daryl can give a bit of, of an update on it. Um, last year, we set some money aside. We did not spend any of it. We kind of just went out to the public to see what they think about it. Are they in support of it? So from there, I'll kind of let Daryl give an update on it. So this is. Yes. So I, I did a little bit of an update on pump track, and that goes back quite a ways. Uh, I had a little video to show you know, what it looks like when they're using it. There were bleachers all around. It was a big event. Uh, Carly got me really excited about pump track. I didn't even really know what it was, but she used to be a Red Bull ambassador and the event thing. So uh, when I saw the video, I thought that is really cool. So we did reach out to a company called Velo and um, you know, just from conversations with Carly, the velo tracks are the only ones that get on the circuit and you want to be on the circuit. You don't want to build like a dirt track because it's a great for the community, but you're not, you're not going to draw anything. So we reached out to the designer. He, he didn't charge us anything. He threw us a couple of options. So what we could do with these are little, little kid tracks on the side. There's a lot of flexibility on where they situate things. We can move around different ways. Uh, so it was really high level. This is what it is. This is what we can do. And then some of you will remember, I, I, I came to you with, you know, different options. Can we put it here? Can we put it here? Should we take diamond one? What about this? This was kind of the preferred option in terms of, you know, what we looked at. We wanted a piece of land that was ours so that we're not getting buried in archaeology and anything else that comes with somebody else's land. Um, I kind of walked away thinking, you know, this, this makes the most sense. So what I wanted to do at that point is, is to explore what the community wants, come back to council and say there's a resounding positive outlook for this. Um, and so my approach might not have been this. We tagged it on to some survey stuff that was being done, not rec specific. It was just, it was just stuff, some parks uh, surveys. A lot of the people didn't know what a pump track was. It, 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 anyway, long story short, I think we had 144 responses on the, the overall survey. And at the end, we talked about the pump track, came back at 55% in favor. So just like it's pretty tepid it's hard to come here and say you know everybody wants it so i guess i'm just seeking direction if, if we want to do more of a, a laser focused uh survey on on you know go to the, go to the hockey game go find some people that are into activity and, and some younger people and just see what the community with the, what the pulse is out there i could do that it would be good to have a little bit of background or a little feedback and you know, if there's support for it, obviously we're going to need we're going to need support from these people at Pine. We do that. So there's, there's going to be an impact to them. It's in their backyard, right? So, um, you no, know, it's going to involve uh, trees coming down and juggling. But maybe we can keep some trees and make it a, make them a feature. I don't know. But uh, so we're we're holding pattern. And I guess you know we haven't funded it other than twenty thousand for design if we want to move ahead. And then we put a placeholder in 2024 for 350. That was the that was estimate that we received last year. So yeah. probably a little bit more than that, but that's we haven't gone any further than that. 
Okay, thanks for the report, uh, Councillor Beach. To the chair, I am so pumped about this pump track. <laughs> and I just, I was looking for a concept or something on our site, and I just, I guess I just don't know how to find stuff. Is it up there? Like, can you find it on, on the city? Images. Yeah, the images. Those also. images. Oh, okay. Because I wanted more information, and I was hoping that you, it was Finley's in part that you were going to put it in. I, you know, like, yeah, we need to survey to get more. If you put this out to the schools, to the kids, they're going to, those young families are going to support this. I don't think they do know what it would mean. I love the concept. I love the fact that you're thinking about it, bringing people in. I was thinking just dirt trails for our kids, right? But this is good. And um, I just think it's time to develop something for our youth and our young families. The last project that was specifically built for them was the skateboard park. You know, when that was built, it was finished in 2004. It's time. Whether, you know, I think we will get support for it if we put the survey out there in a certain way and survey the right people. But I know the kids feel neglected here. The youth feel neglected in this town. And That's so I'm pumped. That's <laughs> Thank you, through the chair. Yeah, the. Um... There's, there's quite a few families that drive to Vernon to use the pump track regularly. Um, it's, it's very safe. It's very fun. And uh, it's the, 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 what's the name of that kind of track, Daryl? Sorry. Started with the P. You were talking about. The, the yeah. yeah. Um, you want that because it will also be attractional for um, weekend tournaments and Mm -hmm. And uh, and end up making us money, but it, that it's a very smart move. We just got to make sure we communicate, communicate, communicate in the process. Okay. So as a plan, go ahead, Pam. To the chair, I I also want to just kind of speak for Pine Street. I don't think you'll get any objection from Pine Street. We live with events all the time. You live on Pine Street. My house, my past place was on Pine Street. You love the interaction with your ball tournaments and all the action that's going on in that park, or you get off of Pine Street. So I don't think you're, gonna, <laughs> you're not gonna run into any resistance from the Pine Street. Okay. Maybe a few tree huggers, but that's okay. If you have to take a lot of trees, we have to that. you won't. Girl, so you guys have uh, anybody else to on, sorry? Yeah, so that's, I like, I called Kelly and I said, why do we need a pump truck for the park? Because um, I read it wrong. <laughs> no one oh, truck. <laughs> well, that's. Uh, oh, right. Right. Uh, truck. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. um, but yeah, I think it's something, and I think it ties into Owlhead and the bike park there. And what it does is it takes us the next level where families will come because um, I know quite a few families that their kids are into biking here in Sigmusa. Corb himself is uh like a world champion but a lot of the there's a huge following through sycamus with him and it will actually bring um like uh councillor evans said people who are camloops they go to vernon and they spend their days here and they will come here if we build it they absolutely will but i think we do have to advertise it because i think there's a lot of people like me that want to know why you need a pump truck for <laughs> really think there's a lot <laughs> Reading Switzerland, it was something nice. All right, well, I think you've got an idea there. Yeah, we'll carry forward as we get through the budget process. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, it's my understanding that we'll do some additional surveying, make sure we're, we have some good community input, and then so we'll keep the 20 in there and then the 350, and we can get an updated estimate and make sure that the 350 we can work within or we'll bring it back. I just say something just on the surveying. I mean, there's different ways to do that, right? If you want to get kind of, you have to go to the right demographic to get their opinion on it too. So just putting it out of mind probably won't be great. We should probably go and talk to maybe some teachers or the principal at the high school and try to make sure at least they're covered. And then you probably get a, get a better sense of your, the need and the desire. Because we just put it online where you're going to have the, you know, 
normal active engaged citizens that might not be users of the pump track give back their opinion but it'd be nice to make sure we got under 18s as part of it yeah and i don't know if they do this thanks court i don't know if they do this anymore but yeah maybe um bob you could get a survey out to the schools to all the parents in that family newsletter i don't know if they have one anymore sigmos mm -hmm. is considering yeah and pull support in from there Heck, I'll stand in front of the school with brochures and hand them out to parents that are picking kids up. Perfect. Good idea. We, we have a small one of those pump tracks at the hub, and when we weed it and the kids use it, they love it. Yeah. Okay. So then, oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Just so that you know, kids are riding their bikes on the skateboard park, which is not safe. It is really not safe because if they fall, it means injury. Oh, point. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're on the topic of biking. The next one, um, the mountain bike park. So we have um, hundred and five thousand budgeted for twenty twenty three, and um, an extension in twenty twenty five of one hundred and twenty thousand. So Daryl can take it away from there. Um, Plans. Yeah, so this is an overall plan of where we're going to go. We want to phase this. Obviously, you know, more trails are better. We want to start with an up track and a couple of down tracks. Uh, if you go through the slide, we're really close. We've got everything in place. We're waiting for provincial approval. And I, this is taking forever. Go a little bit further. This is the letter I got uh, early last year saying I'm not even going to look at it till winter time still haven't heard but, but Jen Bellhouse was here a couple of weeks ago in council and she's been in contact with Marcia and, and it's on her desk which they want to move this ahead is what I'm hearing so we've got everything in place we're just waiting for a green light and a little bit of funding and the way we go so well, thanks Daryl um I, I meet Marcia on Friday uh uh in regards to Blue Lake Parking out, out the problem we have out there. So I'll I'll be bugging her. Okay, perfect. We get along with okay. so, uh, Thanks. So she deals with the provincial government on a regular basis, and that's why we're is there anything else that we can do, Kelly, that you can think of? Like, is there a somewhere we can go instead of relying on someone to carry our message? Is there can we carry our message right to someone? Well, I know, Gord, do you want to speak to it when we write UBCM? We did. We when we met up, met up with John Hawkins when we talked about uh, Owlhead Bike Park, and uh, he understands the problem, and he doesn't have enough staff, and uh, they don't have enough staff to even change the toilet roll holders in the outhouses mm -hmm. in the summer. So that's why all the applications got put on hold all summer long. And uh, he said ours is going to be on the top of the list this winter, and uh, here we are. We're so could we write a letter? Write a letter and remind him. Yeah. You know what? I think that's a great idea. We can do that. Yeah. Let's not rely on someone to we'll carry. Follow it. up after that meeting. Don't, yeah. But talk to her about it too. But let's do our own due diligence. Okay. Uh, the chair. Um, I remember talk about the Owlhead Bike Park when we first started looking at it, and we just had a couple of smoky seasons and I don't know if we'd had the wildfire at that time but I remember talking about using that element up there as a wildfire uh, prevention zone sort of type thing that would be a great value have we presented it that way is that something that we have highlighted in the in the construction of that yep. Daryl you can probably address yeah. it. we've been working with Brett it's Sorry, board. definitely been conveyed that, that that area was fireproofed. They've gone in and done some of that. It lends itself really well to going in now and building a trail because a lot of the low stuff has been removed oh. and dead stuff. Yeah. So, you know, there was a little bit of a delay. They had a couple of blocks of, of uh, timber that had to be, you know, taken out of there. I'm told that they're done and there's, there's, There'd be no more delays. Like we just need a go ahead plan and you drop Trail Alliance is ready to, to jump up there and 
getting something started. Thanks, Darren. Uh, I think, you know, I know Corbin and uh, and Wes Dano, they were devastated when they were logging that. But the plan was to be born with the, the, the fire yeah. mitigation stuff. So, I mean, but it'll, it, it, they can work with it. Like Corbin said, it's, 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 it's they can still work with the with the with the logged areas, and the trails will still come through, and the trees will grow up, and it'll it'll be just great. So, yeah, we're good to go on that one. So, I'm gonna sit on my hands. <laughs> yeah, we can sit on my hands for way through. Just today. <laughs> go ahead, Bianca. Um, the next point is the curling club. So they have put in a request for an industrial dishwasher. Um, we haven't put in the budget yet. We have an estimate about 5,000, but we just wanted to, and do you know what, Ian, we were yeah. <laughs> hoping you would give. Oh, I have a solution for you. Oh, yeah. um, open it up for a council discussion. Okay. That was really do not buy it, rent it. And it basically, when you do that, you can probably get whatever they need for I'm all spitball here because I kind of, I, I currently rent one under 150 bucks a month, and then they're responsible for maintaining it. And there's a couple of names I could give you uh, with that regard. Rather than buying it new, what happens is it just breaks down all the time. These things are not built very well anymore. And so a lot of the restaurants, I think you just rent it and that's their problem. And they come out to fix it and all these other things. But um I, I wouldn't recommend buying it, especially for something like the curling club, where it's going to sit idle for multiple days. Um, you know, it's just not the right way to go. I, I wouldn't recommend it. Okay, thanks, Mr. Bailey. Anybody else? Do we, do we know how, how often would they need that? Oh, how, um, so, so they came to us and, and said because they would like to do some more, you know, events and subletting. Like and mm, I don't know if it was subleasing; it was just hosting events, like to make generate some more income for the curling club, which makes sense. But then, if they serve food, uh, there are certain requirements um, in order to do that. One relates to the dishwasher, so it probably wouldn't be used very frequently. So I actually think leasing one would be great, and that's something that we could say, "Hey, the curling club can lease it if you want it." Maybe I don't know how length how long they do those leasing terms, right? But if they're generating income from it, it's really not for us, right? I'm, and it does have a dishwasher already in there. It's just not a commercial grade one, correct? Right. Yes. Right. And I do recall, uh, I do recall when we were negotiating our leases and everything, there was a big, big problem that they own all the equipment in there and the, the fridge and all that stuff. How often so? Well, we did the renovations back, I believe, in 20, 2014, and we got a $380,000 grant to do the renovations in the lobby. And with that, we did buy the the appliances in there, too. So, Okay, okay thanks. Sally. We'll just look at that. Yeah. So the appliances aren't very old. They just aren't used very much. I was just going to, I'm happy to set a copy of my lease arrangement that we have, mm -hmm. and it's it's a company that comes here quite often and you guys can take a look at it and maybe go back to the curling club and say something like this work. Um, it's, it's just a lot cheaper and you're not on the hook because I mean, the, once you own it, you're also responsible for the repairs. Um, you know, so they're, 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 and those repairs can get quite pricey. Um, I think I, I had a piece done on my, I, I own the one at G&G, &G and that was 500 bucks. By the time you get the technician in there, it's parts. So, anyway. Yeah, you almost end up by replacing it. Pretty much. Like the eagle's nest, like in the, the all the appliances in there, just the maintenance, you, we, you've already replaced a few things. Yeah. It's not that old. Yeah. Oh, well, it's very common that a piece of equipment will break after two years. We had a, we have a brand new furnace and it broke just the other week. They don't make that was ever a year and a half. So thank you, Councilor Bailey. Councilor McKay. Yeah, so the Sick and Lose Curling Club is a not-for-profit society and then they, they rent the, the curling rink, but they shouldn't be responsible for infrastructure. I mean, they should be responsible for routine maintenance, but not for capital costs of replacing infrastructure. I mean, the district has said, you know, 
trying to make a better effort to um, do fundraising and quit coming to the district and asking for money. So they've identified this as a infrastructure upgrade that would allow them to uh, work with volunteers and generate more revenue. So they're asking what the district has asked them to do. And then we're turning around saying, well, that's a good idea, but you pay for the dishwasher. I, I don't think that's right. Uh, Ian, I forget how much you said it was per month. You know, why don't we put uh, a place marker in there for uh, one year's rental of a dishwasher? Yeah, I, it's sorry to the chair. Thanks, I, I think something around that. Yeah, you know, it depends on the you know what you get. I don't think they're going to need a really high capacity one. So if you're somewhere around 150, and it, maybe things have changed a little bit. I ran in mine had the agreement done about two years ago or a year and a half ago, $150 a month probably should do it. Um, you know, like I said, it just depends on kind of the requirement, but unless you have a huge amount of dishes too, I mean, you should be able to find one that can kind of do the job. Um, you know, like the dishwashers we have are designed for hundreds and hundreds of plates an hour, right? In glass. Hey, I don't think it's about capacity. I think it's about code. And I think Interior yeah. Health is telling the curling club that the current dishwasher is not the code and it restricts what events they can have. So I think it's the district's responsibility to bring the infrastructure up to code. Oh, the, sorry, the, I mean, the code is you can actually do the dishes with a three compartment sink and you don't need a dishwasher. There's no, there's no Interior Health code that says you have to have a dishwasher. And then there's different levels, right? You So you can actually wash your dishes with a three compartment sink. That's still totally fine. Very safe. Interior health will just make sure you have all the chemicals, right? Then there's there's a high, like a high temp dishwasher, which is also not required, but interior health will say, hey, this would be the best. But then you can just have a chemical dishwasher, which most people actually have um, just because of the infrastructure needs and stuff. But, um, you know, I think, the best thing for the curling club, I would say to do is like, you know, try to map out a little bit of how many people would be using the facility and for what use and how many people, then you could work back and say, here's what the potential infrastructure need would be when it comes to a dishwasher. But I, I think if you thought about a $150 a month rental, that's probably is going to get you something that would be very useful. Thank you, Councilor Bailey. Daryl, could you get a price on a dishwasher and a lease price on a dishwasher? And maybe just we'll bring it back and, and uh, go from there. That sound good? And maybe, you know, find out if they got enough space. It, it's pretty tight in there mm -hmm. for three cents. But, anyways. Mm -hmm. okay. Is that good, Malcolm? You're good. Your head's still up there. Okay, he's good. Yeah, okay, you go ahead. Yeah. So we'll just do a little overview of our five year kind of um, kind of what we have planned over the next five years. We just talked about current. Um, so this is our 2023. Um, so we've talked about water we planned. So let's look forward wise. So for this and water from upgrades, as we discussed, this is current year budget 26, just for planning and everything. And then with construction starting, this is grant, this is waiting on that grant funding to start of uh, 3.562 million. Um, Capel Street boat launch, we will be updating, putting in a $50,000 placeholder for the current year. Um, pathways and trails. 50,000 ongoing for the next five years. We're gonna look at some priorities there. The pump track, we're doing some sur surveying of the public and getting some preliminary drawings and everything done this year. And then we'll work on updating this 350 number, um, make them more current, make sure it's still, we can still do it for 350. Mountain bike park, 105 this year, once we get the go ahead from the province, and then in a couple of years, we could do an extension. We put in 120 to expand it. Um, curling club, as we just discussed, we'll be looking at lease option buying. Um, the next few items that we've just put in forward looking, um, one of them 
is looking at a couple capital event items that we currently hold being the wash car and the stage. And we kind of touched on this during our operational budget is, um, before I go on that, any comments on the ones that I've just, <laughs> or we're good to keep going. Keep going. Okay, sorry. Um, so we've put this, we've, um, I've heard that we've talked about maybe a beach park pavilion or something to hold, to have a permanent structure at our beach park since we have a lot of events, music in the park there and all of that. So we've kind of put in a placeholder here, um, talking with a few people um, and staff about some opportunities to sell. We do have our wash car, which in the past we've used at events when they were down Main Street. Um, they've been used this past year, we rented them. Um, to IB, Monashi Music Festival, Son of Stomp. So they're getting used less by the district itself and are more being rented out. And every time we rent it out, we're all we're taking on the additional costs of moving it because we do not have the equipment to move it. So we have to pay for that. And then just maintenance. Um, there's been issues with the plumbing. If it's like it's not meant for large capacities of people. Um, Honestly, it's just been kind of a pain, I would say, um, the wash car. So opportunity to sell if we would like. Um, estimated sale price between 60 and 70, we're thinking at this point. And we purchased it back in 2016 for 120,000, just for some background there. Um, and then we also, opportunity, this one isn't as, wouldn't be, as much of a push to sell the stage. We do use it right now for um, music in the park. It was used for Monashi Music Festival, Son of Stomp, which will not be happening this year, um, the Fungi Festival, and the Seminar and Fall Fair used it last year. So it was about um, just over 7,000 total revenue that we got from it last year. Opportunity to sell if we would like to, um, 60 to 70,000 as well. We could take these funds and put them between a towards a beach park, park pavilion. We could look at funding through reserve, look at grant opportunities if, if we need to, um, but just putting it kind of out there on um, looking, at, looking at that, just wanting some council direction. Thank you, Bianca. Anybody have any questions? Mayor Anderson? I don't have, I have comments. Um, so how much should we pay for the stage brand new? The stage brand new was 148,000. So you're suggesting after doing some research, it's probably worth about six, 60 or 70? 70. And we have had interest in both of them. Okay. Yeah. So, and do we think we're a little bit low on 60 to 70 or are we, are, are we being conservative conservative because I, I feel like those are probably worth more at this time and and to rebuild both of those is going to be very expensive so i think that we could probably get a little bit more i like the idea and we may have any even some local interest i like the idea of the pavilion in the park as opposed to the stage because it saves time for our staff and you're not putting up a stage, taking down a stage, you know, and it's it's there and it's there for just a spontaneous event as well. So I do like that idea and I am um, in favor of selling those two pieces and us getting out of the rental business and having a structure. Can I ask one? Can I just continue? If we choose, if we choose to go pavilion. Do we have to do an arc dig again as in the beach park? <laughs> and why, I guess, is the next question when the sand's already been sifted once. Right. That's where it goes. So go ahead, uh, Kevin. Yeah. yeah, you're right, it does. So we've got a map of the area that has been, and pretty much, I think, 90... 8% of Beach Park has been identified as an archaeological site. So if you uh, move any dirt in that site, it needs to be, you need to go through. every time, every time. Yeah. So you have to go through that 10 month process. It's called a heritage conservation okay. permit. Thank you. <laughs> 
anyways, however, there are there are ways that we can minimize that in terms of the design and placement of it so that it it doesn't impact it the same way. So there are different ways, correct, Daryl? Like no different than uh, when the um, they were putting in the Saskia, um screw piles. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like so, there's there's Artwork. ways we can design the pavilion to have minimal impact to minimize our cost, recognizing that's a sensitive area. But yes, we'll have to navigate through that. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, to the chair, a um, couple of things. Um, I do worry about selling the stage uh, because of its usefulness in Finlayson Park. And I do agree with we need a pavilion in the beach park, a permanent one. Um, but I also don't want us to eliminate Finlayson Park as a um, a beautiful location for for uh, staging events, um, and it seems to me that that's what we would be primarily using that stage for at that time. But really nice to be able to have that area available uh, for events like that. Uh, to to speak to the beach park pavilion, that was that that was one thing I wondered was about the archaeological status on on that. Um, I do have an idea that I would like to pitch that would require, it's a floodplain. It has to be filled. We couldn't put anything in there that, that, that we could use, you know, all through the spring up to summer without filling to build on or in. And I think that would increase our season of being able to do stuff down there as well. Um, but I do have an idea of, of placement of, of uh, a staging area and everything. The only thing would be you if you want to put, um, you know, sort of really big pole like posts in that would be in conducive and, and appropriate for an Indigenous themed park, which would be nice there. Um, so I just didn't know when or how I would bring that forward, but it's basically using CPR rail cars uh, for a staging area, and it would sit on top. You wouldn't have to dig. Good, good point there, Pam. And I'll, I'll just kind of say, if um, that's something maybe maybe you and Daryl could kind of do some research on. Okay. Before you bring okay, I wasn't up. sure how that. We have uh, we'll be here at four o'clock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. If you okay. can homework with Daryl, and okay. uh, we'll just carry on the conversation. Shabani, go ahead. Through the chair, um, I couple questions there. What is the lifespan left on the stage? Um, is it going to fall apart in four years and we can kind of cut our losses and run? Or um, if we keep it, is it going to live for 20 more years? And then when the park does flood, we can move it and use it in, in areas like that. So that, that would be one of the things is if it's going to just kind of get rickety and fall apart. One of my concerns is even putting in a, a, a proper stage at the beach park because the beach park does flood and, and last year was a, a, a really good um, where we had to move everything to Finlayson uh, for a long time. So I think if the stage is paid for and it's got some lifespan left in it, um, can we have both? So thanks. <laughs> yeah, I think. Oh, I just, I guess, uh, more of a possible solution. Is there any way where? And then I guess it'll come down to you guys that we could build a temporary one in say May or June and it stays up there for the duration of the season and then you can take it down. So you're only putting it up once, but then it's it's semi-permanent. And maybe that's a potential solution, um, you know, that, that we look at because it does flood, but that you don't have to keep putting it up and taking it down, putting it up, taking it down like we, like we do currently. And it's just a... Do you want to comment on that? Uh, mm -hmm. Hard to comment on that. Yeah. You know, I'm, not, I'm not sure exactly, you know, what, what you have in mind. But if we're going to do something temporary, you still have to recognize people will be up there playing music or whatever. It's got to be stable. Right? Yeah. So yeah. We need to go in to, to make that happen. So if you're going to go through all the arc and all whatever you have to do to, to create stability, you may as well make it permanent in my way of thinking, right? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. What, well, no, I, I, sorry, Mr. Chair. Um, I was just thinking like, there must be some product out there where it's like designed to, 
exist in a spring or summertime kind of location. But it's just more of a suggestion, maybe a different angle to look at it is, is there something that we could use for four months? You don't really have to go ahead and do the archeological, but it would satisfy our needs for what we need. And it just, just more of a suggestion than anything. I, I don't know if that exists, but it's a potential solution where we don't have to do a filled out, maybe. Sorry. Sounds like more homework. Yeah. Sorry, Thank you to the chair. Um, I I would like to sell the um, the wash house or whatever it's called yeah. right now. Um, I'm kind of assuming that the concerts in the park people are expecting to have our stage for this this spring. So maybe we should sell the stage in the fall because um, spring's going to be really quick. Um, but I'd be in favor of selling it after the summer. But the the bathhouse or whatever it's called, sorry. Right away. Wash car. <laughs> the wash cars. No, I think that's I think I think we have some good direction now. I think I'll watch the stock. Yeah, I agree. I think we should keep the stage for now, maybe revisit it in the fall. But yeah, the wash car can probably go for sure. Thanks, Malcolm. Yeah, I kind of agree, agree with Pauline. I, I, I did look at Stage Line's uh, website last night and they don't have any used ones available. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe we should reach out to them and just see what the market is and, uh, and you know, tell them our situation and maybe they give you a ballpark price. Hard to say. And uh, yeah, go, on. go ahead. I don't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. Finish. No, no, okay. Oh, please, no, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> Daryl, where we have, where we've built up the beach park and we have um, the side hill that people are sitting on now facing, is, is that still, does that still get flooded as much? No. It, it won't, not where it shouldn't, not, no. not where we built it up. So the pavilion would be behind that. So there was, there would be no reason to really shut down the beach park because people could enter from behind. So hopefully that's kind of the... Are off at the river, but, but, but whatever. Okay, no, just wanted to make sure. Okay, thanks. Thank you. I think I think we got some good ideas. Um, I think kind of consensus. No one's attached to the walk car, so that's good. Stage, we could get some feelers up, figure out kind of what we could get for it. Um, but I kind of pulled off selling the stage. And if we needed to, like we could sell the wash or use more reserves to, you know, get the pavilion in place and then look at good selling idea. the state good idea. The possibility. And then that money could go directly into the recreation reserve. So just kind of replenish where we're taking it from. That is an option. So um, kind of leave it there then. Um, the next point, uh, washroom facilities. This is just tied with our um, DCC bylaw to some washrooms at... Cumsey and Old Town um, just scheduled in 2025 and 2026. And those are 34% DCC funded projects. So they're in our DCC bylaw. And our DCC bylaw is going to be coming for update. So you can see those numbers shift, but those are the ones that are set right now. Um, and then also the last one, Beach Park Playground Equipment, that's just a placeholder. Um, as it ties to our DCC bylaw, which is also in the updating stage. So those, those numbers are just placeholders in there for now until our DCC bylaw gets updated, but we just put them in there as a you know, forward forecast. Thank you, Rianca. That's the point of information. Where's Tecumseh? Where's uh, there? Is it bottom of my call, Crescent? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, I just didn't know where the projects were. Yeah, Flockies Beach Access. Come, I guess see around there. Flockies. Oh, oh, two mile, right out, right out at two mile. Right. Oh, okay. So, okay, I see. Yep. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. Thanks, Bianca. Okay, and then just looking at our sir. So right now we put an annual contribution of $100,000 into our recreation reserve. And with some of these bigger projects like uh, pump track and everything, we are on a bit of a downward trend mm -hmm. um, just to keep our 
like right now we're we're okay right now, but just to, all of these projects do have costs and right now we are using more than our annual contribution. So just something to keep in mind going forward. Um, we can play around with our reserve um, numbers. We can, we'll present that when we summarize everything where we're at and we can look at moving some numbers around, but just, just to keep in mind, our annual right now is a hundred thousand. So some of like pump track and everything is bringing it down a bit. Um, but I'd say overall, this is a very healthy yes. reserve, like to have almost a million dollars in a recreation reserve. Like when I started, so 10 years ago, we didn't even have one of these reserves recognizing we have boat launches and all this infrastructure. So it's built up over time. So it's okay to spend it, but just recognizing, you know, yeah. Okay. Then, yeah. Go ahead, uh, Mary. Thanks. And Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Bianca. If we can, if there is a little bit that we can add to, because these projects are really important and they're really important to our future because we are very tourism driven. So, and we need to focus on that. So this is stuff that makes us more attractive yeah. all the time. So I think this is really key that we keep our, our eye on our recreation and things to do in Sycamus because that goes everywhere. And people create a buzz, so. Great, thank you. Very interesting. Uh, yeah, just, I guess one, I mean, it's a really good list. And um, I, I think the one thing I'm trying to encourage on the tourism front as well is, let's start thinking about what type of recreation we have in the winter as well, right? I mean, we have a lot of summer-based, uh, you know, recreation, but I think there's a call in the community or you know, a need or desire in the community to think about, well, what do we do in January and February? I mean, sledding is a big part of the community, but, you know, what, oh, we're at it, or, you know, skating or, you know, all, all of those sort of recreational activities. I know there's people talking about, is there a place to go just tobogging, right? Down a hill, like, so, <clears throat> and I think we have some solutions for that when we talked about it, but just something to keep in mind. Thank you, Councilor Bailey. Anybody else? Okay, Bianca. That is our recreation. And if you if you have any ideas or anything for capital projects going forward, like 2024 for all years, yeah. shoot them to us and we can kind of get some cost estimates of what that would look like and how we could potentially fund it. Um, okay, moving on to transportation services. Um, so the first one, uh, public works equipment. So this year we budgeted, um, one is carrying forward the electric vehicle. We have put a deposit down, um, haven't received the vehicle yet. So we're carrying over the 40,000 and that's getting funded through um, grant revenue. That one's coming forward. Uh, replacement of the 2014 Ford 550, we're opening it. Um, we're estimating about 40,000 for the used. So coming in total of 120 and then replacement of a 2017 Kubota, hoping to get 10 for the used. And so a net of 65,000. And Daryl has a little summary. Yeah, I, I wish I would have had a little more time. I only had a year to get this ready. <laughs> the Kubotas. Kubotas, we've, we've used them for years and years and years, and they're good. Like, if, you, if I had a graph up here, I'd show you we spend a bit, we spend a bit, we spend a bit for the first five years. Year six and seven, it, the, the graph goes parabolic. It's okay. Control boxes go, the wiring goes, the harnesses go, the, the trannies go. They should be cycled out every five years. They're just diminishing return after five years. So I don't have those graphs. Uh, the, the Ford two ton isn't incredibly old. It, I guess we're into year nine with it now, but that 
that's a workhorse. That that girl gets full of sand. It's got a plow on it. It's heavy. It's it, it works even out. It's part of the process as well. So I did a little exercise. I didn't have time to do graphs, but I uh, just took the core body of our vehicles. Just this is our core fleet. With, you know the backhoe, the loader, that stuff. The key things, and I threw them on a sheet, and I just. Put down, you know, the age of them, how many years are left on them based on, you know, what a reasonable projection of life is. So uh, if we look at the lifespan on most of these vehicles, I've got a lot of 10 years with the half ton truck. For the most part, the utility guys, the service trucks, whatever, 12 years, yeah, they're getting a little age, but we maintain it. They're always getting, they're always getting maintenance. So I don't have a problem keeping something past 12 years, if, if it makes sense. And I think we've got a couple that are getting up there. I did a column just on replacement uh, dollars on these things. And the dollars we would see if we were to turn them loose at the prescribed time. So when, when they've got a lifespan, if we get to year 10 of a 10 year old vehicle, what do we expect to get? So that varies as well. Like the, the amount of your trade in value is gonna vary based on the equipment. I don't have a very high percentage for, for half tons. So after the end of their life, they're getting back over a loader. You're going to get a lot more back, 40% you know, of what you paid for it. Anyway, it all kind of crunches down. This is our core fleet. And I would suggest just based on the depreciation, if we go by the life cycles that I think are really reasonable and, and some of our experience, especially the Kubota is coming down to five. Uh, we should we should be looking at about 137 a year to keep our fleet where it's at. That's that's the metrics to get to 137. It's just how how they play out through their life and, and what we get back for them. Um, this is in the way now, but if you look at our average age for our vehicles, we're not sitting that bad. We're we're in a good spot. It's the average age is about seven years old for our vehicles. With an average of about 3.7 or, or four years left of life. So we're in a good spot. It's just, it's just a matter of continuing to invest that to keep them there. It, you know, like if we had an average age and we were up around nine or 10, we, we'd be in trouble. So um, this, is, this is just kind of high level metrics as to, you know, what we should be looking to invest in our fleet. It's something to keep in mind, that's all. There are a couple other pages. I've got one for trailers where we throw in, I think it's eighteen hundred a year uh, to supplement the the trailer fund, and the sundry equipment with the with the stump grinder and the chipper and the skidoo and things like that, and that comes up to another ten. So all in for the PW equipment, we should be around one fifty one a year. So, one fifty one. Yeah, just to keep that in mind. Just, just... Thanks, girl. Okay, that's good information. Mm -hmm. Everybody good with that? Mm. Yeah. Nope. You know you gotta you got lots of work to do out there, so you gotta have uh, the right equipment to do it. So okay, moving right along. That sounds good. Oh so, yeah, Daryl. So Daryl has gone through and put in the ones that we need replacing, and then has kind of gone through his fleet and allocated for the next five years. So we have that. Yeah. Just to be clear. This is this is grant funded, right? Yes, that one's yeah. already Everything else on this graph is coming from the public works for sure. Yeah. So um, we do get a little bit of money for green initiatives. So every year through our climate action funds that we get, so we put that to preserve and then we can use it for things like electric vehicles and other green initiatives. So that's what is funding that 40 and then are just regular that PW. Uh, good to know. Any questions on public works equipment? Okay, and then we'll just look at the current reserve. The, the public works. Yeah, the public okay. works. Uh, but in reserve. So right now we are we're, we are putting in a hundred. Um, so Daryl is recommending that we bump that up to one fifty 
from his numbers so that would even us out we're good for the next couple of years but just on our radar if we do want to budget an extra 50 going forward do it now reassess next year um up to council discussion we would uh you know i, I think it's we should budget for it and uh, plan for it this year but you know if we find ourselves sitting at the uh final day of where we're going to find fifty thousand dollars we, we might have to pull it out of barrels but you know yeah. kelly or you had your hand up yeah so there there's an overall bigger picture here and this is we actually put for a small municipality a large amount into reserve so we put annually six hundred and twenty thousand into these specific reserves and then we also put another 450 to our capital projects in the current year so that's over one million dollars of our five million dollars of taxes that goes to capital infrastructure so we do put a, a reasonable amount it's about understanding how that all needs to be allocated and what needs to be replaced when so i think our number overall is good i just think we need to finish our asset management planning for everything and really figure out where that needs to properly go so I think we can internally move yeah. around our contributions, but I think a permanent modification to that shouldn't be made in isolation for one one of the accounts. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. We still have that flexibility right now. Let's just hang on. Yeah. We got enough for next year. And during year end, we can look at it too, because like our year end isn't completely finalized yet. So we can we can look at a big picture. We don't need to do it right now, but Thanks, Bianca. Mayor Anderson. So, um, Daryl, is that the beginning of the asset management plan? I know that we had talked about a pretty um, detailed asset management plan. So, is that the beginning of it? That will be a component in yeah. that. In, yes. Okay. So, do we know when that will, sorry, Kelly, well, that will kind of roll out? Yeah. I'll see it? Now. Yeah. It's being populated now, and I'm told by. March 31st, it's supposed to be implemented. So we're, we're, we're close. Wow. So we'll see that by the end of the budgets here. I would say that would be optimistic, optimistic. and highly unlikely. I would say, I would say more realistic is when we go into this upcoming next year's budget time, we will have a better understanding. I know we've been saying a while, but like, because we have to include our buildings and all of our roads and all, you know, there's a lot of infrastructure that we own that we need to make sure is we've got some money put aside for. Yeah, that's a it's a great idea though. I just then you can have a big picture plan. Perfect. Thank you. That's great. Thank and you. we'll make sure there's lots of graphs that are easy to follow. <laughs> like graphs, pictures. Yeah. Councillor Beach and then Councillor McKay. To the chair. Um, in terms of the asset plan, I doubt that it's on your list, but I did raise the issue of us also including uh, an asset evaluation for our our natural environment, our the stuff that we build our economy around like water and trees and so i'm not sure where at what point we start talking about adding that to the list of assets that we plan and evaluate for but just bringing it up again yeah no thanks pam and i think uh kelly can maybe uh, uh, um once we get a draft we can i'm sure we'll get a, a view of the draft uh, asset management plan it'll be a draft um, yeah, so so this asset management plan is about putting money away for our hard infrastructure. I think what uh, Councillor Beach is talking about is doing an inventory of our natural assets that we have. That so this is more a more economic development type of thing. And I think you know what a, a great time that we can talk about that too is when we do our strategic planning and really what we want to do with that. And I know Scott's going to do. We're doing some community energy planning. Right, that will also kind of tie into that. So I think we can have a ro more robust discuss okay. discussion in the near future. Good. Great. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, go ahead, there, Malcolm. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I had my hand up uh, back back a couple slides in operations there. <laughs> uh, just waiting for my turn. Um, yeah, just for FYI information, so um, uh, staff might have noticed there's a, a Chevy Bolt electric car parked in the library parking lot there, the new one. So Eagle Valley Transportation has received their new car. It's parked in the city district to Sycamus parking lot. So just for um, information, uh, we have a license of occupancy for two vehicles. So 
If you give uh, EVT, Eagle Valley Transportation, a little flexibility this week and early next, the plan is to put the new car where the existing car has been parked, move the existing car to where the van has been parked, and it'll have its own cord that just plugs into the wall. I believe those, those wall plugs have a home run of a, a 50 amp, 50 amp uh, breaker, 15 amp breaker, and then we'll, we'll move the van off the parking lot. So just let the district know, uh, you value transportation preach, appreciates uh, you letting this park there. We have a license for two vehicles. We're gonna move those around a bit and the new one will be where the old one has been sitting and the old one will go about two over where the van's sitting and just plug directly into the wall there. And then we'll move the van off as a parking lot. So good news for the good news for the community. We have a, a new, another electric car. Great, thanks for that update, Malcolm. Okay, that's good news. Anybody else? No, Daryl? Through the chair really quickly, we, we do have another charger as well. So we've taken possession of it and the cord, and I figured the charger and the cord is all we need, but I guess we're waiting for a breaker. But if that comes, we'll install it. So. There you go, Malcolm. Thanks, Daryl. Yeah. And can I ask, have then how many charging stations will we have here then? Three, two, two. Okay. Okay. With this one, we'll have two. Don't we have two already? No. I thought we already had two. We do have two. So this will be the third one, correct? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I drive gas. No, <laughs> <laughs> no plugs in a car. <laughs> Great. Thank you. The other? Avenue Project. Okay. Um, oh, so these are the preliminary numbers we have gotten measuring. Sorry, bear with me. I can ask people to see. Um, so we've get, been given, actually, maybe I'll just pass this one over to Daryl. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, so we're just going to talk a little bit about water. And the roads follows. So we're, so we're getting into the section now. Why I sat by the door. So okay. if quick, I will. Uh, these are big, big ticket items. It's, it's super expensive. I was shocked at the numbers coming back. I know there's big healthy contingency put into these numbers. I think it's 30 or 40 percent, but um, still just sticker shock looking at it. Um, I don't really want to get into phase two and three too specifically. These numbers were just extrapolated from the cost that we're looking at for phase one. So we've been given three options to do Capel Street. And obviously, you know, that water line, maybe not obviously, but that water line is really old in there. It's an AC pipe, which has a life span of 60 years. We're at 60 years with our water lines in. 40% of the community. So we have 40% of our main lines are AC pipe. And if you go by the book, they're at the end of their life. So fortunately for us, we've bedded them in sand because the Lord's provided sand here and we're lucky. They go in and they don't take a lot of abuse in the ground. There's not a lot of rocks. There's not a lot of stuff. So the last three jobs that we've done, we've cut a section of AC pipe out. I sent it to a lab and I got an assessment and an engineer's report. They're saying that 60 year pipe, six, they're saying 60 is the new 40. They said, you got another 20 years on that pipe. It's in really good shape. <laughs> so that is really good news for us. We've got quite a bit of it. It's 20 some, 22 kilometers mm -hmm. of AC to do. And it's deep, and you don't want to be doing it after you pave a road. So I'm going to get through this, and we're going to talk about roads, but they go together in a lot of cases. Um, we, there's some opportunities for quick wins, and I'll, I'll try and get to that as well. Let's stay on topic here. Okay, so, <laughs> so Capel is the first leg of a three-phase 
project. We want to update the water line that's coming up the highway. Yeah, let's jump right into the fire plans. This is from the fires underwriters um, map. So I don't get don't get too concerned about all the different colors. All I want to show you is that they've identified this blue area, which is along the channel. This is this is our riverside area as being something that requires 150 liters per second of flow. Now, fire underwriters does that because they know that there's a lot of density. They know that there's like multiple stories on some of this stuff. This is this is the number that they want us to have on Riverside, this whole area, okay? So if we have the other slide, and I don't want you to get caught up in the colors, but <laughs> this pale green, let's just call it not, not up to speed. We don't have enough flow there. So we're coming in around 90 liters per second flow. We're pretty sorely short of where we need to be. And it does impede development. We've had some, we've had some people come forward wanting to do some things along Riverside. And we're like, well, you're gonna need sprinklers because for what you're mm -hmm. considering, you need more flow. It's not us being the bad guy, them being able to get insurance. It's them being able to just keep moving. So um, we don't want that impediment for side. So we recognize that. We want to take this great flow here that comes from the, from the plant and we want to bring it down Riverside. So we want to do one light here and then we want to do a couple more phases halfway down Riverside in the next half. So this is what's on the book for this year. Um, there's some considerations with that in that we're all talking about active transportation and how it's nice to have continuity through the community and totally agree with that. It comes at a cost. So the, one of the options, <laughs> option two, the cost just jumped. Well, we're widening the road now. So two things happen when you widen Capel. We get down to the boat launch. We talked about it earlier. There's a real problem with parking and stuff down there. Perhaps it's an opportunity to widen that and allow for that. If not, then, you know, we cut it off right at Riverside, maybe save a little bit of money, um, but you provide some active transportation down from the highway right to Riverside. So it's, it's an attractive option. It's a huge number. You know, they did send another option, which was just to go in and fix the water line. We have 22 units that need to <laughs> But we want to do the valves at the same time. It makes no sense to go in there, do the water line, and leave the old valves because we'll be doing repairs. And mm -hmm. so, if you do 22 services off of Capel, you can, without counting them, you could say 11 of them are going across the room the other way. So, you'd have 11 trenches you'd have to come in, and you'd feel it and you'd see it, and it would look horrible. And plus, the road's getting old. So, mm -hmm. to me, let's just get the road done when we go in and do that one. Um, yeah, that gets us started on the three three phase plan to get water to uh, Riverside. Back to Maine. If you go back to the map for a sec, uh, yeah. So we we've, we've also we've got water that goes across the channel here as well, uh, and that's a that's a three hundred mil line. So that's a that's a bigger line. I just want to point this out. This isn't in front of us today. You see how we have great flow through here? This is another project identified for like the near future. I want to get this loop done so that so that we have no more AC plus a bigger line and, and more stability in the in the tree streets for getting the looping done. Anyway, that's not for today. Wait, that's true. That's good. That's the beach. Good chair. Daryl, in that in that planning for flow, um, how much is that allowing or taking into consideration a, a sort of a, a prediction for growth in residential growth, like in those areas where the where the water flow now is currently not enough? Like, have you figured in an amount for so growth? So talking about on Riverside? Yeah. So yeah. we were to boost the water in Riverside so that it's nice dark blue and we have water water yeah how many people will that bring? yeah 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 you know what it's really dependent on what gets developed there but okay so it's hard to predict 
it's it's hard to predict, but what I can predict is if we don't have enough flow, you're not going to get a big unit in there. Yep. Okay. Thanks. And and to add to that, this is a DCC project. It's been identified that it's needed to be done due to growth, so that we can use a third of our DCC funds to cover the costs of, of this. So just an FYI. Okay. Thanks, Kelly. Um, Mayor Anderson. So. Daryl, correct me if I'm wrong. Once you put that line down Riverside, though, even if Three Boys developed, even if um, Norm uh, up by Blue Water develops, that will provide the water flow for those developments? Correct. Okay, so my next question is, from Highway 97 down Capel, there's no cost sharing there. There's no one that we can... Um, there's no DCCs in there or anything coming back to us, correct? That is a DOS bill, a cost to us. But when we get from Capel down Riverside, we can still do that if we have the funds and we can still charge developers who want to tie into that for a portion of that with their DCCs, correct or not? Um, okay. Kind of. So it depends on the timing of development. So we know that there are some development permits out there for some mm. on Riverside. So what we would do is recognizing it's a project for us is work with them. And, you know, as we navigate through the next couple of years, like so phase one, I don't think there's any development that would be able to support that, but phase two and three potentially. So it all depends on the timing of those developments and when they do that in terms of whether we want to wait and make sure we align it so we can capture some of that money or whether or whether we just go ahead and do it. So we will navigate through that over the next two years. So, so if we go ahead and do it though, we can charge that back. We can recoup some of those, some of our money through their DCCs. Like if we have, if we install the water line, and say the three, let's use three boys as a, as a developer, comes to the table, do they get a late char or a late comers fee to tie in? No, we know there's no. Oh, because the district that's how we decided to extend it. It's different if a different developer extended it and we put that on there. But if we know the development is occurring at the same time, we're looking and there's ways we can work together so that they pony up a portion at the same time and we pony up a portion. But not a late comers. Right. Unless, is there anything else you wanted to add to that, Scott? Sure. Uh, so, like, when we collect the DCCs, it's for any subdivision anywhere, that goes into a fund that that contributes to projects. To those projects. So anywhere in town that there's a development cost charge, that's going to contribute to the okay. projects. If someone came, like, Three Boys, for example, they're like, hey, we want to do this development, then right now we can look at it and say, well, you need to replace the water main in front of you along the length of your property. So they would contribute to that specific project. And that could occur, anybody developing on Riverside, we'd say, well, right now we have this project, water main needs to be replaced and you're responsible for replacing the main front of your, your but it's it's not gonna be the full cost that, that Daryl's showing, it's gonna be that, you know. It's that portion. But we do, collect, we can do it on roads, sidewalks, things like that, so. Okay, thanks Scott. No, we have a lot. <laughs> I'll, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm good. I just have one question for Scott, and, and maybe Kelly can help too. Is um, we did pull some DCC money from White Pines that's been sitting for a sidewalk. Is that? And I know we want to tie the legacy or Bayview area all the way down the highway, and our walkway that we're we're talking about doing on Capel is like you know two and a half meters. Would it make sense to leave that two and a half meters alone on, on Capel and, and carry the walkway out down Riverside along White Pine Crescents and utilize their DCC money for, for the walkway along White Pine Crescent and then join onto the highway and then go down? Does that make sense? I think one thing just to get clarity, the DCC is a pool. It's not like we have a designated, designated step for white pines. Um, right now we do have it in the budget, um, which is just two lines down, white pines overlay and widening for 300,000. So right now we do have it, hoping that we can utilize it for doing Capel, 
because we already have teams mobilized, we can have some cost um, reductions, hopefully, since we're already mobilizing team, get one team in to do a mm -hmm. white pines wide together. Um, so we've already we've put in 300,000 this year right now for the white pines overlay and widening. That's just a question. And then um, using DCC money where, wherever available there. Okay, well, I was just wondering if it's designated DCC money for that way. It's not designated. Okay. No. It's not an identified project, nor have we received any money specifically to do that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Mayor Anderson? I, my fear with this is that our developers are being turned off on Riverside. And I hope that I hope that we're explaining it properly or let's just do it and, and pull their DCs and I don't know how we get it back. But I mean, I just think that piecing Riverside until all those developers make a decision is gonna be, it's complicated and it's not good for our economy. So doing that project and saving costs and getting it done, I just, it just makes more sense to me. And understanding too that, that any building growth and stuff is additional revenue, right? Mm -hmm. so, Absolutely. So and that's another way to look at it. If we, if we wait, we're just putting off maybe potential tax Ooh. revenues too. So. Yeah, I'm, exactly. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor Anderson. Um, oh, uh, just one sec, Scott. Um, Malcolm, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, we're, we're talking about water and capacity and for future building and stuff, but on the active transportation side of things, uh, Daryl's got three graphs there. I think we should go for option two as a minimum because living on Capel was my deck facing Capel, my front deck. It's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's a walking loop. They go Highway 97, Capel, Riverside, Maine, right? It's, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a circle loop. And when they're on Capel, they're they don't have they're just a gravel shoulder on Capel, really. So I I think we should have some vision for the future as we're ripping up the roads to at least go with option two to have some sort of path from 97 to Riverside that connects that natural loop that everybody does. Anyhow, we're not trying to redirect people. That's what they do. So we should try and accommodate that. Thanks, Malcolm. Uh, Scott, you would want to. No, I think one one challenge for developers is on Riverside is it's like, okay, I want to build 16 units in one building. And and then we don't have the fire flow, so they can't do 16 units in one building. So they have to do 16 units in units of three, and then their costs go up, right? And and that's the challenge is that the fire flows aren't there for them to build bigger buildings. So yeah, getting that water line replaced will then allow them to go for bigger buildings. Is absolutely key. We need to figure that out. Okay. Uh, Councilor Bailey? Just more of a question. We are talking about, you were talking about this is three phases. I mean, you're yeah. taking us through phase one, right? Yeah. The options there. Does it make any sense since we're talking about getting the flow down Riverside to combine phase one and two? Or is that just <laughs> not on it's going to be really intrusive. Like it's a big construction job as it is. So if you want to tack on, we're only talking about cost. Yeah. Um, I think there's going to be quite a bit in the way of disruptions just to get this done. Like we'll put it up to tender. We're going to try to make a plan so people can get their cars home and stuff. But there's going to be road closures and it's going to be upside down in that stretch. So we'll, we'll do our best to mitigate any inconvenience. But if you tap Riverside or half Riverside onto that, it might not be pretty. But wouldn't you just have road closures again? Like, so some of it is almost like ripping off a band aid. You either, if you're going to do it, you do it and you get the road closures out of the way, or you do it in phases. And you probably didn't have to do another road closure on Riverside, right? For phase two. At the time, yeah. Right. Yeah. So you're pretty much back into some significant disruptions, anyways, right? Like all three phases, I assume, have fairly significant disruptions. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's got to kind of fit into what kind of money we have available to, right? So it's, right. that would be a big hit. I think we were over, well, we're well over 2 million. Mm -hmm. to call, right? Probably closer to three. Yeah. I mean, I, I do take Bianca's point, though, too, and Mayor 
Anderson's point that what are we missing when mm -hmm. we're not doing this work? I mean, it, this is the classic thing with business, right? You invest and then you hope to kind of get it back. And that's kind of what we're talking about here. So if this, if we do phase one and we still don't kind of solve the development issue that we have on Riverside, there's a lot of vacant uh, eyesores there. It would be nice to see that develop. Then are we better to start thinking about should we do it so we can get that other investment is, is what I'm kind of thinking of, Mr. Chair. I think, uh, Bianca, you're looking for an answer on this, that screen there. I mean, I, uh, I do agree we should probably, you know, look at number two, at least number two. And, um, and uh, is, that, is that what you're looking for right now? Um, I think we got clarity. Option two is where we want to go for active transportation for phase one. So phase two, I mean, we hadn't even kind of put it in there as an option to bump it up, but we can look at that and see, you know, too, if, if there's any savings there. These are rough, these, this is a rough number um, taken from our original estimates just from phase one. So um, we, me and Daryl can definitely take that back, but I also just want to look at, so we have our... kind of our five year. So this is just, yeah, phase one, phase two, phase three. And then also just being mindful of where our reserves are at, which we'll touch on a bit. So it's like, cause it's a, it's a big project. Um, here, so we are, you know, we're dipping down. So this all takes time. We put 230,000 annually into the roads and sidewalks. So just being mindful of our reserves because when we get down to, so this is phase one, phase two, and phase three, we're about at red right now. Um, so being mindful of that as well, just to replenish reserves when we have these projects going on. So this um, red line is, with our Main Street upgrades, which we'll talk about um, later. This blue line is if taking out Main Street upgrades, um, where we'd be at with our current projections for other cap for all capital items for roads and sidewalks. So with we can put as much away as we possibly can into road sidewalks, but this is where we're at with our current contribution. So just being mindful of that. I mean, right now we could include mm -hmm. phase two rough numbers looking at, um, so we can look into that. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you could, you could look into that. And, and yeah. But for sure, everybody's good with option two? Option two, and then look into doing phase two. Down Riverside Domain. And if it would even fit this year um, with, yeah. And then also understanding too that we do have the white pines overlay widening. So you have Capel, white pines, and then if we got into phase two as well, there's a lot going on in that area. So if if we wanted to push yeah. white pines a year, yeah. potentially, you, you know, play around with it. We yeah. could do that too. So we can look at some different options there be between those three, phase one, phase two, and the white pines overlay and widen. Okay. Um, I just, I, I just can't um, stress this enough. I think right now we're going into a phase where we've got developers coming in, looking around, and interested in Sycamus. We need to do everything we can to make it more attractive, and I think Riverside is really, really key to get get going on. Uh, through the chair, the difference, it's about $30,000, Daryl, between the two sidewalk types. I don't really understand them. So it's the, the first one, kind of the paved line, and you see on your side, and, and then for $30,000, we get real sidewalks? It's separate. No, it's, it's an asphalt trail. It's uh, okay. So I would, I would, um, since I would push for that we actually do spend the thirty grand and do proper um, it keeps the cars off them. People know where to walk. And I think it just brings up our town to another level instead of a white line saying 
this is our pedestrian path and especially on Riverside in that area, because again, like um, Councilor McCabe said, that is a natural loop that people do. Mm -hmm. um, so I would like to actually see um, number three for 30 grand. I think it's a good investment. To the chair, I mean, that's, it's up to council to decide. Just be aware that if we do look to have a detached Walking back Councillor McCabe's front yard, essentially, or what what he perceives it to be. Yeah. 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 Right? Like a lot of the owners, they Us, right? yeah, hundred yeah, percent. Properties right to the road, it's not. So we would take that. There might be some pushback. It's like to tell, got you know people biking and walking right in front of your house. So something to think about. Thanks, Daryl. Councillor Bailey. I guess the reason I didn't really go with option three is it's separated bike lanes and walking paths it can be a bit of a loaded thing in neighborhoods i guess what i would look for is just what that plan would look like if it is separated and how much of an impact is there i think we need to figure out is the separation impacting snow removal all these other things that we've kind of have here that i mean they have a lot of this in vancouver it kind of works because it rains mostly when it snows, I can tell you it doesn't really work. It becomes a whole different snow removal aspect because you are separating it and then you need different equipment for snow removal down bike lanes. I mean, I'm not opposed to it, but it's just, I think there's probably more to that than kind of meets the eye right now. Where option two is just a widened road, you can plow it and it, things are fairly, I think, simple in terms of just relining it every year and things like that. So I, I'm definitely not opposed to it, but I think we might just need to do a little more research. It's a really good point. I mean, you know, we can, we can do either with the growth that we have, but, you know, widening the road is clearly a lot easier rather than just do another pass and kick it off. Separation, we would have to make sure there is enough separation to get that game between parks and trends in every city where they're kicking it on the road and they kick it back. <laughs> it goes on everywhere and we would be in to that as well. So the homeowners would probably see windrows starting or hearing point through their houses. So it's tricky. And, and the, sorry, I'll just mention there's a lot of BC hydro poles along that way on, on Capel. So when I look at it, it's going to be a challenge to to work around that stuff they incorporated it in the price but so is that enough okay thanks daryl um yeah i just i do have a hard time believing that only it's only thirty thousand dollars different because uh i mean we've always in the planning department over the years we've always talked about snow removal and the cost of snow removal once you get curbs on you start putting curbs and you sometimes you can't push the snow and you have to remove the snow and it's it's, caught, it's very costly for the winter crew yeah, to mm -hmm. do that. So, Mayor Anderson, Councilor McCabe. Oh, Councilor McCabe. Hi. <clears throat> Thank you, through the chair. Yeah. So again, living on Capel, I see it every day, and I am aware of where my property line really is. And <laughs> yeah, I would lose, I would lose some trees and bushes, um, a maple tree, and all my French shrubbery. And my mom um, did some landscaping here. She followed the nautical theme, so I actually have. Um, it's supposed to look like a beach with the, with the with the stumps and the roots and all that. But yeah, that's just the cost of uh, moving forward. Uh, I I'll, I would lose quite a bit of my, um, not my lawn, but all the gravel area that uh, was been put down there to look like a pebble beach, and and all the stumps and, uh, and all, all my trees would go. But it's just, you know, I think we have to do it. Thanks, Malcolm. Okay. I'm just going to go quickly. You know what? I just think that option three with an extra path, I think there's a serious cost to it, event adding up. And I also think that because of the amount of snow we get, sometimes we have a challenge getting our sidewalks cleared right now. Now we've got two trails to clear. So we need to focus on the what's, you know, Great that we have walking trails, but also our staff and our time. And right now, sometimes we go, ah, oh, when's snow? getting removed so i just it's a simpler it's simpler it provides what we need and that's just my opinion i'd stick to option two okay show of hands for option two show of hands for option three okay 
<laughs> Don't put your hand up. You're voting yes. Okay. <laughs> I, I missed Malcolm. Was he one or two? Both. He's hands permanently up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It looks like option two. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for your input, Siobhan. Okay. Do you want to have a break? Yeah, I just want to ask a really quick question. In that reserve chart, which option did you take into account? Two. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I just, it helps. Right on. Right on. Right on. Right on. Right on. That council does want that. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. One more one. Special <laughs> teacher. Um, the road sidewalk storm, I assume this isn't taking into account, say, if we did do phase one, two, and we got a developer that would give directed DCC, is yeah, you don't put any of those kind of scenarios. No, because but the scenario could change if right. Okay. Yeah, we don't mm -hmm. have budget for that. Yeah, no, no, but I, I'm just talking about. Yeah. Yeah. It's fluid. Fluid. Yes. That's a very good. That's a good <laughs> when we're talking about water. Yeah. 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 Okay, we got, a, we got a big list in front of us. We'll just do a quick, short five minute break and then uh, we'll get back at it. We got a little big list. Thank you. It's. Big list was lost. They're all big. Next week, oh, big list. This is big. Yeah. Okay. So our next point is paving. So right now we've put 150,000 in the budget this year and for the next four years, I will let Daryl take it away on paving. So I know, you know, these are long meetings and we talk about a lot of stuff. I don't want to spend a ton of time on background or history or any of that stuff. Just kind of want to get you up to speed where we are, like the reality of our roads. So right now we're actively out doing potholes. It's that time of year. We're going through a lot of material. We're finding a lot of rattling and a lot of, a lot of breaking up of stuff. So just a few, a few facts, just to give you some background. Uh, 89 to 92, over those three years, everything, once we got incorporated, it got paved. So Valley came in and did everything. Not a lot happened for the first number of years. I mean, the roads were good. And, so there wasn't money put aside for that stuff. We started doing repairs in 2007. In 15, we got a formal assessment because we had a lot of roads failing. Urban came in and they said that, you know, here's a list of stuff you need to do right away. So out of, out of the projects they identified as being do them right away were some of the tree streets and their methodology was to rebuild the road. It's past the point of saving. So if you want to rebuild a road, it's probably four times the cost of just pulverizing and paving it. And the typical way of doing a road, they come in and they mill and they take away and they come and pave. So um, spoke with Valley, said, what if we pounded this stuff into the ground, like we've done in Alberta, we pulverize it and it'll enhance your base, then come back and do it, well, we'll try it. So we did that on McLean McPherson, where we had one to Owlhead, those big heaves. That was our little test area. We pulverized it, we paved it. It worked out to be about $100,000 to do a kilometer of lane away, great value. And we enhanced the base and it stood up pretty well. So that's kind of a, a good news thing. We can kind of do this on the cheap. We don't have to rebuild the roads necessarily, but I, I'll say if we wait too long, you can't pulverize. Because when you start to do that, you get big chunks instead of just grindings. So there's a bit of a tipping point. Anyway, that's what we've got. 90 million kilometers <clears throat> throughout town. If we do the pulverizing paver at 100, 100K, it's probably up a little this year. It's probably 110, 110. We have the lifespan of asphalt. You know, we're no other than, than anybody else. We're getting to that point where a lot of it's failing. It's starting to fail. Okay, So overall, you know, go back to day one. We pave it, nobody thinks about roads. Really should have been putting away 300K a year. It should have been into a reserve and sat there until we got here today, but we're, we, don't, we don't have that. So uh, that's just high level. What that number in my mind will keep the roads, you know, in theory, 
what we've got now, 300K will keep them. So now isn't great, but you know, you want to improve and the number goes up. Anyway, um, so we'll keep moving here. This really quick historical, I only went back to 09, because if you go back to when they did pave it you know, almost 20 years, like 17 years before this, there was virtually nothing spent on the roads that whole period. So then we started to wreck on some stuff in 09 and 10 and 11, but still thoroughly short of the 300 that should have been invested all along. So we've got a couple anomalies. Uh, one was the, the latest one in 21 was a little bit of money taken out of the Solskjaer Bridge project. The engineer had made it a certain area to cut and to cut and to rebuild. We called them off. We said, we've got that money in place. <clears throat> the base is fine. Just pave it and we'll throw it into Solskjaer Road. So that's some of the bridge money. That's why that number is bigger. But we got Solskjaer coming into town. The entrances to town are huge. They're a high priority. So that's where that came from. And the 505 is another big one. That aligns with what we did in Shushua. When we did the sidewalk, we did the road. There was extra money thrown into the roads that year. But for the most part, we fell way short of what it takes to keep the roads going. And, you know, we're starting to see. Them. So, as I mentioned earlier, it's a dance. There's, there's AC pipe underground and there's roads that are failing. So, you know, in a perfect world, we'd approach this in two ways. One, we would identify key places that we want to upsize the AC pipe, start on that program, tie the roads into it as we go. And then, you know, in a perfect world, we've got a little side project where we're pulverizing and paving on the cheap wherever we can. So I've tried to divert whatever I can over to the tree streets in the last few years, just pulverize and pave one, pulverize and pave one. Lots of residents, lots of impact. We actually got phone calls about how happy people were. So, I mean, that's the community wants to see that stuff. And I, I know you guys know that, just that we've got a big network out there. And there's a window. If we're going to go in and pulverize and pave, we have to do it in a way that makes sense. So if you're if we, if we wait five years or ten years, and you go in and pulverize and pave it, you've got AC under there that's now almost at the end of its life cycle. That window closes. You don't want to pave it and then dig it up and do the water line. You want to try to you want to try to get. I was getting into the tree streets because we've got twenty years left on those water lines. Let's get them paved for cheap. So that's why we're aggressive over there right now. And strategically, I think we need to do some real long-term planning on which water lines, which roadways, and then what can we get for a quick pulverize and pave through town for quick wins. So anyway, this is just kind of where we're at and what we're trying to do with what we've got. So hmm. beautiful graph. <laughs> beautiful graph. Data. Or after this year, knowing that we have some other larger road projects as well, we can put 150 in there right now. With the asset management plan coming forward, I think we'll have a better understanding of where we need to prioritize, what roads first, all of that, and then we can really attack it. Um, so right now, we've just put a placeholder of 150 for this year going forward, but we can up that if necessary and figure out our funding methods um, going forward. But... Daryl's very passionate about our paving program, and you can see so he's uh, he's thinking about three hundred. So that's in our minds as well. And as soon as we get that asset management plan to really back it and build our priorities, I think we can build off of that. So yes, thank you for clarity. Three hundred would keep us where we're at, and we're way behind the curve. So mm -hmm. you could look at getting four or five kilometers of road done a year for the next while, like. But probably 80 left to do. So. And keeping in mind, this is the reserve that um, the Riverside Avenue works is coming out of as well, that we put about 230 in a year. Yeah, so sure. there's all the store. Yeah, exactly. There's a lot of stuff that comes out of this. Yeah, comes out quick. Okay. Mayor Anderson? I was just going to ask if this is included now in our asset management plan. So obviously, roads and, and any, any infrastructure underneath is all taken into consideration. So my next question is, which I don't even know if, is, if it's on our radar, uh, the golf course roads, uh, spall machine. At some point, that's going to be our responsibility when that um, Mary Hills 
golf course resort starts building up because it's not the CSRD's road, it's the District of Sycamus. So I guess if it's not on our radar right now, perhaps we should consider putting it on a radar because it's a stinky road and it does, it's in need of repair. Thanks, Mary Anderson. Yeah, that, um, I think we probably should be talking to the CSRD when they go for their development permit. Maybe to, I mean, if they are got their, but their next development permit. They're not going to pay is, for this. Uh, you know, our road goes to the IR number three. Right. And it is, it is failing a, a couple of corners as you go around the corner just by the bridge there. But we don't know what the bridge is doing as well. So that'll all kind of tie together. But something to for sure keep on the radar. Put on our radar. Mm -hmm. yeah. That road in our road assessment plan, like is it? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, that's good, Bianca. Thank you. Okay. Um, we've already kind of touched on the white pines overlay of where we put uh, 300. Um, 300,000 this year um, for our discussions with the Riverside Avenue project, we will look at that um, prioritizing phase two over White Pines. If I'm good getting direction there, we'll skip over there then. Okay. Yeah. Can I just add that for Daryl there, right in the corner of White Pine, Crescent and Riverside, there's a uh, massive big dips uh, kind of been happening over the last that's that's a concern. There might be a leakage or something under there. I, I if you go around that corner, it's pretty uh, right on Capel. Right on no, right on uh, White Pine Crescent and Riverside. So right out in front of Aquamare uh, condominiums. Okay. And you start to go around the corner towards White Pine. Right on the corner there, there's a whole bunch of really big dips starting to happen. We're we're seeing we're seeing a lot of that right now with. The heaving this time of year. I'll it's look. I'll summer time too. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's, they're all summer too. Yeah, it's summer stands is getting bad as well. But yeah, we can, we'll check the storm there and make sure everything's okay. 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 Um, so the next one, Broom Road Stability Assessment, and I will. There, I'll take it away on this. Yeah. So everybody's familiar with Broom Road. The highway and then Sycamus Road does a bit of a switch back. We go down the hill here. So a few years ago, uh, I got a call from a resident down here saying that the wall is failing and the district should come and fix the wall. Uh, went down and took some pictures of it and uh, we got an assessment on it. I had somebody do a just a, a quick write up on that property. The reason I'm concerned about that retaining wall, not so much for any other reason than it's it's holding the road up, right? Like so, um, I guess I got a picture here. Yeah, so that's the backside of what was built in the day, and it's it's kind of it together at different times with different construction techniques and and. Um, Whatever the homeowner wanted to put there, they kind of did back in the day. With the, the work going on at the bridge, when they get started and they start piled up, I see this getting a lot worse. That's why I wanted some pictures of this stuff. We can just keep an eye on it. I've got a letter saying that this road won't fail till 2024. So I needed that, I, I've got that. And as the bridge construction continues, we we'll keep an eye on it. And it's, having a negative impact, maybe, you know, we go to MOTI and say, help us out with this. Just, uh, I, I think it's it's going to have a big impact on this. Anyway, um, we've put a little bit of money in to take a closer look at it. I, I think it's probably a good idea to do that. I know a retaining wall down the length of Brune Road would be like super expensive. Properties are offset by a lot. So maybe even just as they start blasting rock, Maybe we can divert, you know, appropriate cobble in place and just armor that side. And so I, I want an engineer to look at it and give us some options. Thank you, Daryl. Daryl Anderson. So should we have a discussion with MOTI about this? Should be should this be in the scope of some of their work, like making sure that they're not destroying the DOS uh, residents or roadways? It's, it's so been before them several times. 
Does they know we're super concerned about this? But have they agreed to include? They've include. They've agreed to monitor it as they as they go through the process of building. So we've got our pictures. They have their pictures. We're saying this is going to fail. They're saying no, probably won't. I, the only thing is the word monitor. Like they need. I think they need to commit to the game if they're you know if this is going to start. We should just make sure that they're they're in the loop and know that this is going to be part of your responsibility or request it because we know how how easy it is to to work with those folks, but needs to be kept on their radar. Documented. Uh, Councilor Bailey. Yeah, I was just going to say. I mean, monitor is a nice way of saying I'm not paying. Uh, <laughs> you know, unless something catastrophic happens, and I I agree with. Pauline and Mary Anderson, um, that it's probably a good conversation to have now. I mean, we don't even know when this thing's going to start either. I mean, it, it's, yeah, I don't, I don't even know what I'm allowed to say. I'm not allowed to say about it, other than this is like the never ending, you know, construction story or a bridge is going to happen. But I heard that three and a half years ago when I came to Sycamus, they were going to start it that year. But, um, yeah, here three and a half years later, we're still waiting. But I mean, is I mean, to Colleen's point, I mean, is this something that we can say we need to have some answers to now rather than wait for them to just say, hey, we'll monitor it. It fails, then we're going around looking for what would probably be a really expensive project for what is it? How many houses down there? Let's say probably eight or ten, maybe. But you'd be talking significant capital costs. Yeah. 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 And I think a reason we'll, we'll be in contact with MOTI and we'll be, I think if we do just some preliminary work, we've taken photos and I think we'll be in contact with MOTI frequently. In addition, they are coming. Uh, they're penciled in for the March 8th open meeting. So they're coming at one o'clock to the committee of the whole on March 8th. So that's also a good opportunity, like, you know, for elected officials to ask questions while we, and point these things out as well as from a staff, we will do it as well. It's an FYI. Councilor Red. Um, through the chair. Daryl, if it does fail, is it just cracks in the road you can't drive on it fail, or that's roads gonna kind of fall in? Because um I know the area over there quite a bit. Like it's pretty, it is it's probably well, it's over a hundred years old since since the hotel's been there, right? Um so when you say fail, is it you can't drive down it or it's gonna slide in and take houses out? Yeah, so there, there's no imminent risk to, to life or anything. Whatever happens there is, is going to happen in slow motion. It's going to start to separate and pull apart. And you know, we do have some water lines that cross the road. And I mean, it, it gets complicated as things start to happen, but it's, it's, there's no danger of a slide or anything. You know, just a quick question. Is there is there any water problems over there? Like, is it constant water coming out anywhere? Or is it, uh, after that have I am not familiar with where it is, but I just haven't really noticed if it's got water issues because that might, might change after all the blasting. Yeah, so there's a, a few water issues. Uh, um, so, so they're fed off the CPR reservoir, which is small capacity, and you know, half an hour drains that reservoir, right? So the, the fire flows are insufficient, I guess we could say. Um, you've got but a sample station down the road here where we'll flush. And so there's constant water running at certain times of year when there's nobody in those houses. Sometimes we have to leave the water on to run, uh, just to keep the water fresh so it's potable. So, but dr drainage, like, is there any drainage issues with uh, water coming underneath the highway and then coming into that area? And is that why it's sloughing? Or is it just what's never built properly? Yeah, I, I just it's not stabilized properly. And I think, you know, over time, you can see what they call the pistol handle trees. You can tell the, you know, the slope has shifted over years and the trees are kind of showing it. Okay. It's very slow motion stuff, but it's, yeah, it's that retaining wall's not built right and it's not holding. Okay, good to know. Oh, Councillor B. 
uh, to the chair, just just noting though that with all of the there is going to be a fair amount of blasting when they get started, right? And that's going to shake everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think we know that they know. Mm -hmm. that. Okay. Go ahead, make noted, and, uh, and we'll move along. Thanks, thanks, Daryl. And I think the big thing to know is like we put twenty in. At first, we were just thinking five, but twenty will give us like a good assessment of where we're at, what we need to do, kind of cover our butts, and. Uh, Make a plan going forward and it would be nice to capture some survey points so we've actually got empirical evidence this is this has changed yeah something we can go back with it's nice to have a report it's nice to have some data that supports the report for them okay thank you mm -hmm. if you have any you should, you should take a drive over there mm -hmm. tell you yes <laughs> Let's just look at our. So, we talked about all of our current year ones, other ones for future. Um, we've talked about Riverside Avenue, PW equipment, paving. Um, other ones in the works, uh, Baby of Storm Works, uh, 2024, that one's just been shifted over, um, Pogue Storm Works identified, um, that would be doing in 2025, uh, Pine to Sherlock Road, that's a part of the wire, water line upgrade, the loop, um, into 2025 start, and then, um, the big one, which was discussed discussed last year, was the Main Street upgrades, and that one's being shifted to 2025-2026, and I have a breakdown of that one. That was discussed last year, so this one is bringing BC Hydro Lines under so this is from paradise to shoe swap um bringing the lines down and just doing some upgrades on our main street there with we just wanted to highlight with this one just where our reserves are at right now um bringing in to consideration main street we'd be dipping down and we'd need to look at our funding if we want to push this one back, since we have other priorities of, you know, doing the the, the water main upgrades down Capel and Riverside, we're suggesting we push this one off of our five year plan and look at it into the future. We have a lot of things going down Main Street, you know, affordable housing and all of that. So staff is just recommending we did have it on our previous five year plans. We're recommending taking it off for now um, until we figure out ways to. A fund it and knowing that we have other priorities. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of our five year picture right now. And um, yeah, Kelly has and we do it. have the sidewalk curb and gutter on the one side, it would just be on the other side of the street there. So, and that's also all that property is, is prime for development. So, another option is wait for the development to go and it does goes piece by piece, right? So, we will do, for example, the housing piece when that piece is done, right? No, good point, Bianca and, and Kelly, and uh, I, I agree we should. Uh, I agree. A bit. Anybody else have any comments? Okay. Long? Let's see. We're good. Oh, wait. I don't know. Oh. Stop there. Close some of these tabs. Got a million going on. Uh, <laughs> Hey, buddy to the dog park. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> you totally did. <laughs> so that's our completion of presentation. So moving on into our general. Well, so our biofuel facility is getting um, 
completed. It we're expected end of March for it to be in completion really? and then operational. So we're not allocating any additional funds. That's all being previously captured. So this is just um, carryover and finishing. Um, our charging station, uh, we've received the station. So now we just have to install and everything. Again, an unspent portion that we're just carrying over. Um, computers, another one we budget for every year. Um, mm -hmm. Our computer, new computers, computer upgrades, server upgrades. This one is now taken out of the budget. We previously budgeted for 2023 of 75,000. It is no longer in the budget now that we're moving to the cloud. So these are kind of old, old bits. I don't know if anyone has any discussion points on them or we can just carry on. Pretty good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Um, so daycare and i'll let kelly speak on this one yeah so we the first item on there is the 7500 that's actually an operating thing not a capital thing but next year is capital so we just thought we'd have a discussion about about both right now so the 7500 i've reached out so this is uh related to have crystal come over and manage the facility um there's a payment of 7500 that um, she has three years that has to make a commitment of. So what this would be is we would pay that. Um, and then in turn, she would commit to work for the facility and have her children there for three years. And if she doesn't, then she would have to repay it back each year that she wouldn't be there if she were to leave, which by the way, I think it's going to work out really good. Crystal's very excited. She's been talking to a lot of people. She's been talking to Amar. They're really, really working together nicely. I have had uh, already four people reach out to go on lists that they've now reached out to um, Amar and Kieran to get involved with the daycare. So I really feel like um, there is an uh, a great opportunity and they really care about the community and the and the direction of this facility that it can can. Um, achieve for the community so the one piece is is the 7500 which we are planning to fund it from the operating reserve however i have reached out and i'm trying to get it waived so i don't know if we're going to have to pay it i'm going to work hard so we don't have to pay it but just to have it in there just in case and then next year so talking to amar a, a grant was submitted under his not-for-profit uh for 90 percent of the cost of the renovation of the of the facility what that renovation would look like um is a, a modular uh, from TA, uh, basically that will be about $680,000 by the time all the servicing and everything is there. That's the, they got 600,000 as a budget because it has to be 1500 square feet uh, to accommodate 24 um, after, before and after school kids uh, programming, right? They, they're feeling there is a very big demand for this. So the difference between what we're doing right now and what they're proposing to do is that theirs is licensed. So that is huge for um, the parents because what that means is starting in September, every parent now gets $550 for before and after school care that would go right to the licensed provider. We're not a licensed provider. So our parents have to pay full price for that service that we offer. They're doing it licensed. So it's actually going to cost the parent very little for that. And they're getting a lot of information about that and they're they're right on it. So there, there's a big demand for that after school care. So that's part of it. And then renovating the inside of the building so in a, it can accommodate the existing um, two to five-year-olds, but add 12 infant toddler spaces. So they're going to add 12 infant toddler spaces and 24 after after school programming and it'll all be licensed. And they and so so right now we've got they're they're estimating about one million dollars for everything in there. I think so we have about a hundred thousand for twenty um twenty twenty four, which we wouldn't have to um pay until the very end till all the costs come in. And that's a very so that's why it's in 2024. Uh talking to the grant funders, uh, there's a lot of interest in this in this program. So um we're we're pretty confident we can get that money, uh, but they're not gonna announce it until at least April, May. And then we don't green light for the building of the modular until after that. Uh, so it's the timing of that. So yeah, we like it in September, but the reality is is it probably won't be occurring till sometime in 20 2024. 
But so I just wanted to uh, explain that. And if you have any questions, I would be um, happy to answer them. That's kind of the skinny on the daycare. And the 100,000, we have um, adequate funds in the office reserve account, which is where we used to take the money from for like our server upgrades and stuff. We have adequate funds in there to fund the 100K. So. Great, Kelly. Great, okay. great job. Anybody have any questions? All right. Um, and part of that, sorry, and part of that grant application as well is included like a, a bus, like a, so that they can do mm. trips and pick up the kids and stuff like that. So they're really trying to plan full meal service for the community for, I think it's over 56 kids, you know? So I'm, I think it's great for the community and the fact that it's licensed and there'll be subsidies available will, it'll be, it'll be a pump in place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Thanks, that's awesome. Bob, you have yeah, just to add to the positivity. Um, Sandra works, she used to work for the license shoe swap after school program in Salmon Arm. And so the bus picks the kids up from the schools, takes them there. And uh, they are one of the first, right now, they're functioning as $10 a day for after school care. So, so parents that get this grant can easily afford the 200 bucks a month per kid, which, is, which makes it really affordable. So, good thing. Thanks, Bob. Okay, that's great. We all can move them, move them right along. Okay, <clears throat> left. Um, housing projects. We've just put in a placeholder in here of fifty thousand. Um, so just have it in there for any planning work, fire surveying, pre-construction work, any of that. Um, total scope of the project is still in the works, as all councils aware. So we've just left it in there. 50,000 this year for any planning needs. If Kelly wants to. Yeah, and if anything changes on that significantly, we can always do a uh, financial plan amendment. But for now, we don't have enough information to put anything intelligent in there other than we may have to do some surveying and some other work. So we'll just put a placeholder for that. And if something significant arises in the year and we have new information, a financial plan amendment can easily be done. Okay. Thanks. Um, yes, server upgrades, no longer there. Um, and then the healing center will come to council at the next week. Um, and then our reserves. So when we look at general, the main one we have for our reserves is our office and computer equipment. So that's a healthy reserve, which when we look at our reserves overall big picture, we can look at this reserve because we do have a healthy uh, amount in here which potentially we could, could do, we could ship. Um, so then um, the fire plan, Brett's input on this. Um, so we have some carryovers, we had training props for the building from last year, that's being carried over. And the engine five has been carried over. I spoke to Brett and um, 650,000 should still cover it. So he doesn't want to, um, to bump that up at all, which is fantastic. Um, and then new, so we have an 18 foot SPU trailer currently, um, a structural protection unit. So that's what it stands for. Um, it's 18 feet. Come March, 2024, the province has changed it. Now you need a 20 foot in order to be like a qualified SPU trailer. So we're planning to put it in the budget this year as it's coming in next year. Great thing about this unit is it does generate quite a bit of revenue when it's used, um, which, I mean, you don't actually like when it's used because that means that our province is on fire, but it does generate income. In 2021, this thing generated, what, probably over 100,000. Yeah. So it does pay for itself. And when we get those net revenues, we put them back in this equipment replacement reserve. So it pretty much covers it. Covers it. Um, and then another request was for a used truck. Um, I spoke to Daryl and we do have a truck that for PW purposes needs replacing, but it's still workable for moving around a trailer. You know, not a it's not used a ton. Um, so we're proposing to move it from the PW fleet over to the fire fleet and filling that need there instead of going out and buying a used truck elsewhere where we don't know where it came from. So um, that is 
fire capital for this year. If there's any questions. Is that good? Daryl had a you good, Daryl? Yeah, I think so. And um, the truck wouldn't be needed until next year when we're. Thank you. Set <laughs> oh, that's what you were. That's what was on your mind. <laughs> We're going to do it in internal transfer. Um, the, this SPU trailer doesn't need to be in place until 2024. We want to get it up and running for 2024. That's why it's in this year's budget. Daryl does not have to give up his truck until next year um, to pull the SPU trailer. And then it can also get used for Fire Smart. Um, right now, we do have a Fire Smart grant in there for this year, but Brett has budgeted um, that we need a vehicle there. He put it in his grant application to lease a vehicle for that period of time. So we're okay for this year. Okay, thanks, Bianca. Uh, Ian? Yeah, what do we, um, well, we should point out that this money is, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna point out because I'm, I see so many of these examples. The province has changed the regulation. We talked, I actually talked to the fire chief and he says, basically the extra two feet, it's fine, but he fits everything that's gonna go into this 20 foot trailer into an 18 foot. Foot trailer. So the reason why we're spending this money is because this some regulation change. Yeah, we looked into like the grant grants available to like can we fund the trailer? Pretty much, it's like not for SPU trailer on all of them. Sometimes you can get equipment to go in the trailer, but not the trailer itself. Right. So, but what, I, what are we gonna? Is there a plan for the eighteen foot trailer then? Um, yeah. Currently. Just need a welder. It works once we get the 20 foot. I think we can really look like if we would want to sell right. it. Right. Um, Brett has some other ideas, which we'll bring next year once we're kind of there sure. for the 18 foot, and we would put that back into the fire equipment reserve um, to replenish it. Brett does have some needs elsewhere that he has um, signaled, like for his uh, rapid, rapid water equipment and stuff like that for other storage. But I think that's going to be a larger picture because. These trailers do need to be stored somewhere. Currently, they're in the PW yard. So that'll be mm -hmm. a bit of a balancing act that I think we need to talk about internally and stuff. Right now, I haven't budgeted to get rid of that trailer, but it could potentially be an option to replenish that reserve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Bianca. And then uh, just the five year budget for fire. We are budgeting for his tender six truck. For those that um, went and checked out the fire truck, Brett probably explained it to you. So we budgeted um, over two years, just kind of putting money towards it. Usually it's at like a deposit and then purchase kind of thing, two-stepper. Um, and then we did have the fire hall upgrades farther up. We've pushed it back. Um, still keeping it in our radar for the five year, but. Um, we're painting it this year, you know, doing some free things. And and there's capacity limits and fire hall right now just isn't in the in the forefront. So we just push it back to the very end of our five-year plan just to keep it on on our radar. And yeah, so in that too, we have our five-year reserve chart. Um, so this is where we're at for fire equipment. And this is where we get our new unit in. And but the thing about fire equipment is we have big lows and then we build up. So the SPU trailer helps us build up. Right now we're just budgeting in, you know, we have a big purchase this year. So we're going down. We'll have another big purchase going down and we'll replenish as we go. So really, I'm not too worried about this reserve budget right now. I think it's doing its job. Um, I don't expect us to actually hit here when we replenish with revenues and stuff like that. So um, that's for the fire equipment. We have a separate one set aside for the fire hall, which mm -hmm. if it happens, we do need to, we'll budget for it accordingly. Um, right now, not, not too worried about it because it's not in our forefront. We put away 20. Um, once we really see the need there, I think we can start putting away. But um, any questions on fire? Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, the hall itself. Yeah. So is I am assuming it's in our asset management as well. Do we have like is there a lifespan on that facility? Like, like does Brett have a time when he thinks he might outgrow it or it needs to be repaired or it, he needs more space or anything like that? Or are we sufficient right now with the fire hall we have for years to come? That's from my understanding with discussions with Brett is he's not seen it as like a, it needs to happen. Yeah. Okay. And and we did have it in the budget to do a feasibility, like an assessment last year and mm -hmm. then he decided not to do it. And so he said we didn't need it. So there, there's got to be some reason and logic behind him and Brett's not here right now, but we can, you know, I hear what you're saying though. What a date. Uh, yeah. What's, what's the expiration date? So, cause we need to plan for it. Right. Yeah. 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 When we, uh, when Ian and I went for a tour, and we missed Pam. She just went out the door. But uh, we went for a tour, and, and I kind of poked Brett over the years to start, you know, figuring out because there's other halls that were actually getting uh, grant funding for fire halls. So just keep an eye out. You know, talk to those fire chiefs or whoever, and even come up with a template. Kelly had mentioned too that they do have templates and. And from on a box. Yep. Mm -hmm. box. Yep. And it's called. Uh, Scott Builders, who built uh, Lakeside Storage's building, is roughly about the size of a fire hall that would be able to house all Brett's equipment and everything. And uh, and there was, you know, the, the thing is, is it, it takes the time to build a fire hall where you're going to put your equipment. So we also talked about another location and we kind of thought, you know, out by the public works yard as you drive in on the right hand side, there's a lot there that, or even on the left hand side, there's a lot there where you could actually build the fire hall. And if we had, did get a grant and and uh, build a fire hall, and then once the fire hall's built, you move everything out, and we go ahead and you know sell that lot, you know, because you could put two, you know, a couple fourplexes on there. It's a pretty big lot. <laughs> so we're working on it, but yeah, yeah he, you know, he could get some pricing for fire halls and stuff like that. Go sure, um, and also the space, like they, where you put in a new fire hall, like if you do. You know, I mean, it's got to be property that you've obviously invested in, and it's got to be planned somewhere. Yeah. 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 Okay. Good. Excellent. Our water and sewer. Um, so we have CPR booster station retrofit. This is a carry forward budget um, and it ties to the big bridge replacement. Uh, Daryl wants to speak on that at all. Yeah, I, I could comment on that. We, um, we've got single phase power powering the pumps and they're, they're just little guys like nine liters per second. These little guys pump up to CPR reservoir. So to increase the fire flow up there, we don't want to build a reservoir. That's super expensive. We can get pumps that actually get it up there quicker. We will be able to achieve what we're, we're trying to do with, with more size. So uh, the first step is to get power there. We've spoken of MOTI with the bridge project. They've committed to bringing three-phase power our way. So this is a, a small amount to, to get that started with the design and everything else. So we'll just coordinate it with how the bridge goes and, and uh, hopefully in the next couple of years, we can get a couple of pumps that are sized for three phase and move more water quicker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the 20 is just kind of like planning and everything like that and then 150 is more of the work getting done. Um, Capel Riverside Main up, upside, and I think we've had a, a discussion on that one. So that's phase number three years. Potentially, this one could move up to 2023. We will look into that. Um, time to Sherlock Main upsizing. This is a, a funding partially from DCCs, and I don't know. Do you have a graph for that one? I don't think so. Um, but that one isn't. For this year, we're looking a couple of years out, um, planning in 2024, <laughs> and then works to be done 2025. Daryl? That was that little looping 
portion that I showed on the fire flow map where we want to kind of mm -hmm. close the loop on the blue, get fire flow around the residential area. Yeah, so we were looking, we were looking to just kind of close that and provide a newer and a more capable water line through there. Oh, okay. And then Main Street line upgrades, um, we've spoken on that one on not a priority, that's the Main Street. Um, and then we just spoke about about taking it off. So we'll remove that one. And then Mara Pump Rebuild, High Left 202 for 65,000, Daryl. Yeah, so the, the high lift is the little building right next to our water treatment plant. So we produce the water, it goes through the contact chamber, and then the high lift pumps it up to the reservoir. So if you were on the tour, we had those little R2D2 pumps that are standing there. 202 is the one that's slated to be replaced. It's uh it's it's tired, it's been it's, it's been gone over a couple of times, and it's time for replacement. So that's water in a nutshell. If anyone has any questions or comments on water, water in a nutshell. <laughs> okay, so sewer, we have Butwell lift station, um, 650, and that's some carryover from last year for the planning. Uh, Daryl, we've got urban systems doing. A, a little bit of a study on how we can increase the capacity of our well-up station. Um, I don't have that slide on here. I have it on a, I have it on a, a, a different place for later today, but um, we've got a pretty big area that flows into the well-up station, which is not a very big wet well. And where is it? Where is it? Yeah. <laughs> It's on a different presentation. <laughs> the map. You mentioned that already. It's not in here. Is it one's like a dump, though, isn't it? I, you know what? We'll, we'll get into what feeds into it later. It doesn't matter. What matters is that pump, when we're seeing peak times, you know, we've got two pumps in every lift station, they're alternating. And, and when it gets busy, they're, they're pumping like way too frequently, we've got no response time at all. So we're looking to increase the capacity of it. Uh, the money carried forward is, is still kind of over in progress. Urban's gonna give us some options. We need a bigger wet well. I'm not convinced we do. We might be able to do something beside the lift station that adds capacity to be deep into the lift station. They're, they're pretty good at that kind of stuff. So uh, we'll take a look at what the plans are and then obviously I'll come before council and explain you know what their recommendations are, but but well is a pinch point. But uh, we got the car wash, we've got the dairy on, on board now, we've got that whole neighborhood yeah. across the highway. So um, we'll get into that stuff later. Okay, thanks, Daryl. Anybody have any questions? Oh, very long. And then the uh, wastewater treatment plant upgrades. Um, we've just put the so we're doing an assessment on drainage issues with the rapid infiltration basins. And we put a placeholder right now of 50,000. <clears> um, total costs to be determined from the assessment of samples and drilling. Daryl wants to touch Now, we, we've got them out there now. They're, we're out taking samples at different levels. We we got in there with our excavator, did a, a trench uh, that they wanted to see. So we're taking samples at different levels. We need to find out what, what the pan of the sand is. If we're, we got too, so many fines that it's just like blinding off and not draining. But we've got three infiltration basins that are starting to give up all at once here. So uh, it's a serious concern. We're, we've, treat, we've treated all the effluent coming in. We're, you know, we're meeting our, our parameters is what we set out to do uh, with the last grant. But it's flows now. It's like now that we've processed as much and more people come into town and the numbers get up a little higher every summer, we've got to be able to drain that stuff and, and that's the, the escape plan. So 
they're drilling uh, today, and uh, we got to get to the bottom of it. Do you know, Mayor Anderson? So I, I have a couple questions, but I think it's their kind of wrap up questions. So are we at that point? Well, I just have you go ahead first. <laughs> I just I have to go back a couple slides. <laughs> I just have a question for Daryl on this okay. particular point. Um, you have 50. I, yeah, you it was really good. You you brought us through this during the during the tour, and it's really good. Um, so you're assuming 350,000 to kind of bring these back up or hold on a second. This, I, this is this is separate. Okay. Um, I have to do with the water treatment plant. So this is a new project for the current year, 50,000. So is that, is that 50,000 placeholder? Is that gonna be enough? No. Right. No, to be That's, determined. We're good. Okay. We're getting yeah. info now and I'm hoping we can get this all tied in. It's, a plan here really, really soon. It's kind of a must have, not a nice yeah. to have. Yeah. I, I don't think that number that you just mentioned is that far off. If we staged it and right. we looked at doing one at a time and we have three of them. So we'll see where, okay. where it comes in if, if needed. Right. Maybe we can skim a certain layer. Maybe we're told to take take a foot off the top and, and that solves our problem. I don't know. But we're sampling every layer and finding out what's going to work. And and so what you're going through now is trying to determine yes is there any easy fix versus coffee yeah, okay right yeah yeah mm -hmm. thanks Ian. thanks Daryl. good to know got through these last three points and then we can go back calling <laughs> <laughs> um lift station radio replacement we had put in there 120,000 last year um because our old radios were not going to be getting supported anymore, a bunch of municipalities went, hey, no. And it, the company was actually bought out. So our old radios are supported. So we did not have to spend that 120 last year. So just highlighting that, that was a good win. Um, pump replacements, um, we just have a 20,000 placeholder for continual pump replacements to make sure that we're keeping up. Um, and then, Low station upgrades we have um, projected for starting 2025 onwards. Um, Daryl, you want to touch on that at all? Uh, so just refresh my memory. So for this line item for this year, we've got nothing. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I think. That's what well, I, I know that initially we went in and I had half that amount over four years. And when I got a quote, it was almost double what I thought. So that's what we're doing. We're pushing it a year and we're going to just couple that amount so we can go after the four lift stations that are old style. So we've got Maine, we got Moore, we've got Parksville, we've got Silver Sands. And I, I know as recently as Monday night, I was wishing it was a newer one because we were on Main Street and that, that thing gave up overnight. And uh, yeah, all I got was good. So uh, yeah, so those boards are slated to be replaced over time. They're, they're old and they, they need a whole rewiring job on them. And yeah. It's okay, let's start them young. Yes. <laughs> yeah. proud we've had a new mayor. <laughs> and look how excited he is to be in the in the gallery. It's like, oh. <laughs> well, I guess we'll move that to next year and that's what we want that. Okay. Okay. And I'll show the reserves. So our reserves are I'll go deck lining right now. They are pretty healthy, pretty healthy reserves. We put 210 into water and sewer. We put around the same back up. Yeah. Any questions? Or Oh, yeah. Well, actually, I, 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 I brought this up before, and I can't remember the answer to it, but Daryl, you made me think of it again today, and that is the, uh, the dump, and they use DOS water when they have issues up there. Is that correct? Do you see, 
a problem with that or do you see benefit for them to have their own well up there so they can um, keep spraying down their their stuff like is it costing us how are you you know uh, equipment right like not enough to worry about oh we charge about 95 cents a cube for water right so you know we're going to charge them 20 bucks a truck or 30 bucks a truck load I don't think there's that big of an impact, and a well would be a lot of trouble. They're way up there, right? So a well would be a you know, big problem. I, I don't see a big impact for us. Okay. Yeah. No question. Are they on a meter? No, because they'd be pulling off the hydrant up there, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I knew the hydrant was right there. I just wanted to see if they were on a meter. But they don't use speed kind of Let's pick it. They don't really use the hydrant unless right. that uses it. Really, I think. But that's the volume we're talking about, right? Is that what you're concerned about? Hmm. Yeah, they use uh, just taxing our system because you know what? I mean, it costs us money to replace filters and keep equipment working. And so just want to double check on that. Yeah. And the, my other question was, and, and now I'm going to go back to storm water and drainage. So and I, and I don't know the answer to this, but when a developer comes in and he is um, required to put in storm drainage into, and maybe Scott, you can help me along with this. He's required to put in storm drainage or does the DOS manage our own storm drainage? Like, are we going to the province, I guess, to find out what they want us to do or are we managing our own storm drainage? Maybe Scott can help me out on this. <laughs> But I, what I would say is that when somebody comes in to build something, and that's what we're talking about, um, they have to manage the storm water that's on their property. Yeah. That's kind of the unwritten rule. And I wouldn't say unwritten, you can actually find it. <laughs> you can find that somewhere. <laughs> Not out of the office. But they, they should be managing their own storm water. Um, but you also said, or does the district look after their own storm system? Yes, that's true too. We have our own storm system for our roads. And typically we well, we don't let people plug into it. It's for our roads. So you're developing and a general storm water. Um, you're building a road and we're gonna take it over, make the storm system handle the, the water for the road. That help. Well, okay, so as an example, just so I know, because I'm, I'm, I'm asked a lot now. So say a developer is developing uh, three boys. Okay, what is the requirement for them handling their storm water there? Or is it connected to the DOS system already? Like, Scott, you want to go ahead on that one? Yeah, so if, if they want to send their water somewhere else, then they and it's going to end up in the lake, right? So sorry, it's going to end up in the lake. Like essentially, our that's where our storm ends up is is in the lake. So if anybody wants to contribute to the lake, they need to, they need to go through Ministry of Environment to get permission to send storm into the lake. So we do have um, a subdivision that's coming up, and we and they they want to go into the lake and we we were like why would you want to do that like it's complicated and they're like no we got it covered so they, they want to send theirs to the lake so so if they want to send it to the lake then they have to go through the ministry if they want to tie into our system or manage it themselves they can put in a dry well or a lagoon or something so if they want to manage it themselves they can they should we ask them show us how you're going to manage it um and really we don't give them the option of tying into ours okay thank you scott there's like parts of that is right it's, it's their own property that right. they're, they're looking after but we as a, uh, a municipality might ask them to put in curb and gutter and, and storm on the on the street mm -hmm. correct yeah so that's a second yeah that's the, okay. the off-site works that's governed by our subdivision and servicing bylaw yeah yeah, yeah. okay okay yeah, just in a place like Riverside or places that don't have a ton of space and we want to maximize 
you know, FSR developable space, why wouldn't we allow them to tie into our sewer? Is it just a capacity issue or is it just, we've always done it that way? Like what's, what's the rationale for it? It, it is a capacity issue completely because they're going to be pumping from a low spot anywhere along Riverside would be. And, and to bring it back to the road, which was, you know, designed to take the water from the road and get it around the corner, down Capel, and then overland through the ditch. It's not, that's not a huge volume. I mean, it rains hard, yeah, it, it's just moving. And there's, you know, a few pieces that go different places and we have dry wells. But if you're act actively pumping a big amount into that storm system and the water level's high because of spring, it's gonna fall, it's gonna flood all the way down that line, all the way up that line. So we we encountered that at the end of Finlayson. Water level comes up, everybody knows it's high, um, and it rains, just the function of it raining fills our storm system up. So the guys are out there with a little pump trailer, they're emptying the storm system into the lake. So um, yeah, we got a lot of work after the okay. and the lake's high. And Darren, you also have to sometimes plug the system so it doesn't back back up. Yeah, the, there's places where it's that. So you, you, you end up, you know, you're fighting lake level. Exactly. You isolate the storm and then pump it out as needed, right? Okay. Also, be the chair. Um, just thinking that with uh, individual property owners and they're managing their own storm drainage and is there, should we be concerned about any storm water just going directly back into the lake? Or should we be thinking about um, trying to make sure that it's filtered in some way? Like I don't, if you have a flood, thinking how it floods down on Riverside, I'm just thinking of the kind of stuff that's sitting around and the kind of gas and, you know, extra stuff that would go directly back into the channel or into the lake. Do we need to be, I think we need to be concerned about that. Well, the province is certainly concerned about it. And, and I guess, you know, if we see it, we should be reporting it or informing them, but they have parameters to where they'll allow or what they'll allow. And they take all that into consideration, right? The province does. Yes. Okay. Okay. Anybody else have any uh, questions? Bianca, you got uh, anything else in closing? Of 11. Thank God. <laughs> okay. I guess we can uh, adjourn now. Uh, recommend that the Select Finance Committee, February 2023, be adjourned. Malcolm. I have a. Uh, <laughs> I was turned up. Uh, no. He's voting to adjourn. Go ahead, Malcolm. No, he wants to adjourn. Oh, he wants to adjourn. Oh. Yeah, yeah, that was that was the journey. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Anderson second. All those in favor? Hi, Malcolm. Hi, Hi Colleen. Uh, <laughs> I guess we're back in an hour or 45, 45 minutes. minutes.